Okay, hello to you all. Uh, welcome to our lecture series on foundations of science. Uh, scientific realism is the whole ring for Lesung. And um, today, um, yeah, my name is Gerd Kritzek and I'm uh, honored to welcome you in the name of the Naturwissenschaftscafé, who are the organizers of this Ringvorlesung. Um, and I would like to hand over to Professor Müller. He will introduce our uh, guest today and our speaker today. And uh, please also spread the word about our lecture series and tell people to come and, yeah, thank you. So it's my, my great pleasure to introduce Professor Anthony Valentini to the first speaker. So Professor Valentini is well known as one of the leading researchers in the Brocken Bohm exploitation of quantum mechanics. He received his PhD in 1992 in Trieste, in Italy. He has been working in, at the University of Rome in La Sapienza, the Imperial College London, and he was also visiting professor at the Institute for Theoretical Physics. Um, now, what I find fully remarkable is that instead of just following the latest fashion, I think Professor Valentini has always been following what he finds is truly important in his interest in the foundations of quantum mechanics, um, even if it involved sometimes periods of teaching and also working independently. Now, since 2011, he is a professor of physics at the Clemson University in South Carolina. And yeah, we're glad to have him here today, so welcome. And we're looking forward to your talk, the, the Broglie Home Pilot Wave Theory. Thank you so much. I assume that has some significance, but um, thank you so much for the welcome, the invitation, um, and congratulations on, on organizing um, what, what, what sounds like a wonderful initiative. I, I wish there were more things like this um, around the world. Um, my subject is the De Bruyne Bohm pilot wave theory. Let me give you just perhaps very quickly some uh, historical context where this fits in, I think, uh, in the overall development of physics. There is an old and new controversy about operationalism versus realism in physics. Um, in fact, it just occurs to me now, I could have put in this slide that even in ancient times, uh, in astronomy, there were comparable debates about whether you just have a, a mathematical theory that can predict the motion of points of light in the sky, um, as in Ptolemaic astronomy, or whether there should be some physical understanding of what's actually going on in the heavens. Um, you, so you can trace this, this, this kind of uh, two schools of thought, if you like, in, in, in physics, back to ancient times. Um, more recently, of course, um, in the late 19th century, famously here in Vienna, uh, there were two camps. Uh, Mach championed the idea of an operational physics, um, the idea that physics is just a way of, of organizing sense data. Um, Ostwald promoted the idea of energetics, that physics was about the production and transformation of use of energy, and this was, of course, related to developments in thermodynamics. At the same time, there was Boltzmann, who was a realist, who championed the atomic theory that gases are not just what you see macroscopically in the lab. They're actually made of invisible things called atoms uh, moving around according to, at that time, Newton's laws of motion, and he was one of the developers of the kinetic theory of gases. And, and as we know, eventually, it wasn't until 1905, with the, our understanding of Brownian motion by Einstein and Smoluchowski, that in a sense, Boltzmann won this particular uh, um, debate, if you like. But as I said, this is an old and a new controversy. Um, and in fact, in the 20th and 21st centuries, the comparable controversy is still raging. We have um, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics and what you might call um, its neo-Copenhagen incarnations, where quantum mechanics is viewed as an operational theory. Um, just think about what you can measure in the lab. Um, 
Some people like to use the word information. I think there's just a, another way of saying just talk about uh, what you can measure operationally in the lab. And then the um, opposing school of thought, well, there are, um, generally speaking, uh, comes un under the heading of realism. Uh, there are various um, camps within the realism. The one I'm going to focus on is uh, hidden variables. It says, well, behind quantum theory, there are actually there is a deeper level of, of, of parameters that determine the outcomes of events. And these parameters, we currently can't see them clearly. We can't control them properly, but they are there, and they explain what we see. And let's see if we can develop this and possibly find evidence for the existence of these parameters, just as eventually Boltzmann and others uh, succeeded with the kinetic theory of gases. There's a particular theory I'm going to focus on, the De Bruyne-Bohm pilot wave theory. Um, perhaps I should, there's a good point to mention here that if someone asked me, do you believe De Bruyne-Bohm pilot wave theory? I would say, well, I think it's, um, it might be true. Um, if there's something in it, it's probably only approximately true. I think of it as being perhaps a bit like Boltzmann in the 19th century with his idea of the kinetic theory. Imagine that molecules or atoms is a little, is a little hard sphere. Atoms, little hard spheres bouncing around. It was a simple model of atoms which captured a lot of truth, but of course it was only an approximation. Possibly the Broy bohm pilot wave theory is something comparable. All right, what is the Broy bohm pilot wave theory? So this theory, what well, is a new theory of dynamics. I say new, it was actually presented in 1927 at the Solvay Conference. <coughs> it is a deterministic dynamics of individual systems. Now, there are a lot of myths about what happened at this conference. Um, I've co-authored a book with, with Guido Bacigalupi in which we translated the proceedings originally published in French and we've added a lot of commentary and analyzed what really happened. One of the aspects that interested me the most is that um, it is largely unknown, not only by physicists, but even by historians, that during the 1920s, de Broglie was developing a new non-Newtonian form of dynamics. Most people don't know that. They think that what he did, well, he just extended wave-particle duality from light to matter. He had this formula for the wavelength of a moving electron, all very nice. But actually, that was just a byproduct of what de Broglie was really doing. Um, his new non-Newtonian form of dynamics, which he presented at the Fifth Solvay Conference, looked like this. We have, this is for a low-energy, many-body system uh, of spinless particles. Um, you have the usual Schrodinger equation for many body system. And uh, in addition to the Schrodinger equation, there is a law of motion for uh, the particles. So in this theory, there is this is a um, sketch in configuration space. Uh, that little black dot. Is, is represents the configuration of a many-body system. In other words, the positions of all the particles uh, that are present. And here are the wave crests of the, the wave function, which we decompose in terms of an amplitude and a phase. And um, the, the law, de Broglie's law of motion is this here. It says that the velocity of the nth particle is given by the gradient of the phase with respect to its coordinates divided by the mass. That's a law of motion for velocity. So, you just, if, so if you just think, if you've not seen this before, just imagine you have the wave function from any body system, and there's this extra thing that in addition to the wave function, there are actual particle trajectories determined by this law of motion. Now, um, so the motion, so let's think about this, this dynamics is grounded in configuration space. So for this particular system, we have the configuration of an n-body system, so it's, uh, it's 3n dimensional. Here is the configuration q. The motion of the configuration is determined by what de Broglie called a pilot wave psi, where psi obeys the usual Schrodinger equation. Now, mathematically speaking, Let's just look at these equations and, and just, just for a moment and think of, think of them uh, from the point of view of a mathematician. Given the initial wave function, 
the Schrodinger equation implies the wave function at all times. That's clear. Given the initial configuration, the second equation implies the configuration at all times. Because if you know the wave function, then you know this phase function at all times. So you know the right-hand side of this equation. And you can integrate this equation, given the initial configuration, to determine the trajectory. So this defines the deterministic dynamics of individual systems in principle. Um, here's an example um, for, for the, let's look at the two-slit experiment. Um, I have a wave coming in from far away, a, a single particle is what we would normally say, a single particle is striking a two-slit screen. Given the wave function and given the initial position of the particle, um, so the particle starts somewhere. We don't know where it starts. We don't know where the particle starts, but it starts somewhere according to this theory. The particle trajectory is determined by this law of motion. This law of motion is postulated to be true, even if in practice we don't know the initial position. You might think it's a little bit like Boltzmann saying, let's postulate um, you know, that we've got these invisible atoms that are moving around in accordance with Newton's laws, even if we can't actually see them. By the way, I'm very pleased to have Boltzmann here uh, <laughs> watching over me as I speak. Um, so, uh, clearly, um, here, as the, as, on, on, as the particle is coming in, we have approximately a plane wave. The gradient of the phase is just a constant. The particle just moves uniformly in a straight line. It will go through one hole or the other, depending on where it started. And on the far side of the screen, I have two waves emerging. This is just the usual Schrodinger wave function. Um, and the gradient of the phase is more complicated. And the velocity uh, will wiggle around, and you get this kind of trajectory. Now, a couple of things important to note about this dynamics. An individual system is described by both a configuration and a wave function. The wave psi has no a priori connection with probability. One way to think about this very crudely is imagine classical electrodynamics. I've got an electromagnetic field. It's moving around obeys Maxwell's <coughs> equations. I put a charge here. The Lorentz force law determines the trajectory. So you could imagine that this, this Schrodinger equation is a bit like Maxwell's equations for the field. This is a bit like the Lorentz force law. But of course, the equations are different. And even more strikingly, this wave is defined in configuration space. But it's regarded as a physical thing. It is a property of an individual system that guides the motion. Uh, of psi determines the motion of an individual system via the equation of motion. So forget about prob the f in the foundations of this theory. There are no probabilities. The universe consists of just, there's some con there's a there's a there's a universal wave function. There's a universal configuration evolving according to these laws of motion, and that's it according to this theory. Now, what we can do in practice is we can consider an ensemble of systems with the same wave function and different configurations. Remember, I prepare a system with a certain wave function. I don't know where the configuration actually is. It's in there somewhere, according to this theory. So imagine an ensemble of systems with the same wave function, but where from one element of the ensemble to another, the actual initial configuration is different. So I can consider a distribution of configurations. Um, now, we recover quantum mechanics, and I'll describe this as we go along, if we assume that the initial distribution happens to be equal to psi squared. Um, this is often taken as a postulate of the theory. I think that is completely wrong. Um, in fact, almost, well, just about all other workers in the field regard, say there are three postulates in this theory, Schrodinger equation, the de Broglie equation of motion, and this postulate about the distribution. I think this is wrong. This is not a postulate. This, I'll, I'll talk more about that. But let me just say, if you assume the initial distribution is psi squared, then you recover quantum mechanics. And there's an important thing that we need to get clear is that once you begin with this distribution, rho is psi squared, you're stuck there. The dynamical equations preserve this distribution in time. 
Let me show that. Illustration for one particle. This generalizes immediately to an arbitrary system, but let's just look at it for one particle. Single particle Schrodinger equation implies what you normally call a continuity equation for the modulus of psi squared, where you would say that the, this quantity here is what you call a current is equal to psi squared times grad S over M. All right, now that's just from the point of view of this theory, psi is a field, and this continuity equation is just a, a property of, of the, the modular squared of the field satisfies this equation. All right, so far so good. Now, de Broglie-Bohm pilot wave theory says that in addition there is a particle moving around following this law of motion that the velocity is the gradient of S over M. Let's now consider an ensemble of such particles where each element of the ensemble has the same wave function but the starting positions can be different. So we can consider a distribution of positions, and we're assuming, now just think about this, I've got an ensemble of particles with some distribution of positions. The distribution row could be anything, it doesn't have to be psi squared, it could be anything. We're assuming that each particle in the ensemble has a velocity given by the gradient of S over M. By construction then, the distribution of particles must evolve in accordance with this continuity equation. This equation just states that I have an ensemble of particles with density rho where each particle, wherever it happens to be, follows the velocity field given by grad S over M. Right. So now we have a simple theorem because look, lo and behold, uh, the equation for psi squared and the equations for rho are exactly the same, the same partial differential equation. So if rho and psi squared happen to be equal at some initial time, they will necessarily be equal at later times because they obey the same partial differential equation, the same initial conditions will give me the same solution. So, um, all right, let me just quickly run you through that you know, I've done it for one particle. Let's look at a theory with a general configuration a system with a configuration. This could even be quantum field theory, where the configuration represents the configuration of a field. But let's say, generally, if I have a, a system with a Schrodinger a wave function and a Schrodinger equation, the Schrodinger equation will imply a continuity equation in configuration space for some, for some j. For instance, for, what, for instance, for one particle, it looks like this. Parenthetical note, for a system with spin, psi is a multi-component field, um, just, just in case someone is wondering. Um, but let me just, just carry on here for this case, where, where I just have a one-component psi. The de Proy equation of motion, in general, for a general system, states that the velocity of the particle is given by j over psi squared. And note, so far I'm talking about the dynamics of one system. Nothing to do with probabilities, size, a field in configuration space that describes the mo that, that generates the motion of one system. Um, we can now, let's write our velocity field, uh, just call it V. So we have, from the Schrodinger equation, we have this continuity equation for psi squared with a velocity field V. And again, by construction, an ensemble distribution will obey that same equation because we're assuming that each configuration follows the velocity field V. So again, we have the theorem that rho in psi squared is preserved in time, the Born rule. All right, now let's consider the example of the two-slit experiment. Um, this is widely cited. It's still often cited as a proof of the non-existence of particle trajectories. So Richard Feynman, for instance, in his otherwise wonderful lectures, Feynman lectures on physics in, in the 1960s, said that, well, really, this is the only mystery of quantum mechanics, that somehow the particle doesn't go through one slit or the other, it doesn't go through both, it, goes, it doesn't go through... It, it, you can't really say what it's doing. This is very strange because this phenomenon was first predicted in 1923 by Louis de Broglie on the basis of a theory with trajectories. I repeat, at that time, nobody thought that an electron would behave like a wave. De Broglie, as early in his first papers in 1923, predicted electron diffraction and interference. 
on the basis of a theory where the electron is a particle that's guided by a wave. Um, so this, this is historically most bizarre, because imagine um, in 1915, Einstein predicted the deflection of light by the sun, and in 1919, people observed it. Imagine if that observation had been taken as proof against general relativity. Ridiculous. Somehow, de Broglie predicted this uh, on the basis of a theory with trajectories. When it was observed by Davison and Germer in 1927, it was hailed by Heisenberg and others as a proof of the non-existence of trajectories. But all right, let's move on and just say, well, how does the de Broglie-Bohm theory uh, explain two-slit, the single particle interference? Well, it's extremely simple. Um, I fire a particle uh, at the screen. Um, the wave function just follows the usual Schrodinger evolution. The particle starts somewhere, we don't know where, and it will have a trajectory determined by de Broglie's equation of motion. Note the theorem we said that, well, sorry, let me, let me just step back. Let's imagine now I repeat this experiment. I repeat this experiment. The particle will start somewhere else. We don't know where. And it will land somewhere else. We repeat it again. And slowly we will build up um, a, you know, a series of spots of where it lands. We don't know where it begins, but we see where it lands. And we repeat this experiment many times. We see the usual interference pattern. How do we explain that? It is trivial. Remember the theorem that if the initial, over an ensemble, if the initial distribution happens to equal psi squared, then it will equal psi squared at all times. So let's assume that over the ensemble of repeated experiments, the initial positions are in fact distributed according to psi squared. Let's just assume that. I'll discuss how to justify that later. Well, if it's true, if the, if the initial positions over the ensemble are distributed according to psi squared, then the distribution of final positions will trivially be equal to psi squared, where psi is now psi at the later time. In other words, the wiggly, the wiggly wave at the backstop agrees with experiment if you assume rho is psi squared for the initial ensemble. Trivial. But note... It disagrees with experiment if the initial distribution is not psi squared. So let me give you an extreme example. Imagine that over the ensemble, it just so happened that all the particles start at this same point, or very close to this same point. According to this theory, in principle, that could happen. What would happen, every single particle would land here or, or around here. There would be no interference pattern. There would just be a little spot at that one point. That would be an extreme case. You might also think of an ensemble where maybe all the particles begin just in the top half, and you'll find that then just the top half of the interference pattern, this kind of thing. Anyway, generally, the point is it disagrees with experiment if the initial distribution is different from psi squared. So, uh, there's a broad conclusion. I'm going to talk a bit later on about quantum measurement theory and so on. The two-slit experiment is nice because it's very simple and visual, and it actually captures all the essentials that we're going to need, as I'll show you later on. So generally speaking, just think of this as a little sort of um, microcosm, if you like, of what happens generally if you do general quantum measurements and so on, that in quantum equilibrium, if the, initial, if the density is psi squared, you get the same predictions as quantum mechanics. In non-equilibrium, you get statistical deviations from quantum mechanics. Now, beware. Other workers in the field artificially restrict the theory to equilibrium either explicitly or implicitly taking as a postulate the idea that the initial density should equal psi squared. So, for instance, Holland, in, in his excellent textbook, 1993, um, Dur Goldstein Zangi, 1992, is a very influential paper. Uh, I think this is, this is wrong, that this is a, in principle, it's a deterministic theory of individual systems. The laws of motion are the Schrodinger equation and the de Broglie guidance equation. Um, the initial conditions, 
Whether you're talking about the, well, there's also, of course, the initial wave function that I have listed here. There's also the initial position or the initial configuration. Or if you're talking about an ensemble, um, the, um, the initial distribution over the ensemble, they are empirical things. Just, just think of a simple example of Newtonian mechanics. Um, you know, if, if I drop this, don't worry, I'm not going to do it. If I drop this thing, the trajectory is determined by Newton's laws. It's also determined by the initial position. But most people would agree that, look, Newton's laws are postulated laws, and, and there's, of course, evidence that they work. They are laws of motion. Whereas the initial position, this thing did not have to begin there. It could have started here. It could have started there. If I want to know what laws does this thing obey, what laws of motion, those laws are valid everywhere, they're postulated, they're often thought of as, as, as eternal. Um, whereas if I want to find out the initial position of this thing, I have to go out into the world and measure it. It's not something, the laws of physics are not going to tell me where this thing begins, starts. Okay? So there's a clear distinction between laws of motion and initial conditions, which has been badly modelled. Uh, unfortunately, one of the tragedies of de Broglie-Bohm theory, this elementary distinction has been lost. Um, and anyway, we'll, we'll say more about that. So beware. Um, in my view, no, 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 no. The laws of motion illustrated here in the two-slit experiment, the laws of motion are postulates. The initial conditions are empirical things. They could have been this. They, could have, they are what they are. They could have been something different. To find out what they are, we go out into the world and, and gather evidence. Um, so this is a theory in which, in principle, um, you can recover quantum mechanics if you choose the initial conditions appropriately. There is also a wider physics outside the domain of quantum mechanics. So according to this theory, <coughs> quantum theory is a special case of a wider physics. Pilot wave theory includes physics, includes quantum physics and physics beyond the domain of quantum mechanics, in principle. Um, now, you may say, all right, it's all very interesting, sounds exciting, but experimentally, you always find the quantum equilibrium distribution. Here's an example. Let's say you, um, you take, this is a two-dimensional box. I've got a particle in a box, and I prepared it in a, we're in a state that is a superposition of the first 16 energy states. So you could do this in a lab. I have some two-dimensional electron system. I, you know, excited. I got a, the wave function is a superposition of the first 16 modes. And let's say I prepare this to particle in a two-dimensional box with that initial quantum state. And I measure the position of the particle. I'll get one value. Say I repeat the experiment. Measure again find the particle is here. I repeat this many times. I find a distribution of particle positions that looks like this. And if I do the experiment tomorrow, I'll find the same thing. And if you do it in, a, you know, in, in your competitor's lab somewhere else in Australia, you get the same thing. You always find the Born probability rule Y. So, normally, People say, well, there is no why. The Born rule is one of the fundamental laws of physics. There's a Schrodinger equation, there's the Born rule, this is just one of the uh, fundamental laws of physics. Um, De Broglie Bohm theory, I claim, um, actually, um, this is not a law of physics, and there's an, but there's nevertheless an explanation for why we always see the Born rule. So, here is, um, let us begin with this initial, initial state. I prepared a particle in a two-dimensional box. The wave function is a superposition of the first 16 modes. And then I just let it run. I let the wave function evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. This is what it looks like. It's a periodic system. Okay, here I've evolved over one time period. So this is psi squared at the initial time. That's psi squared at the final time. It's periodic, so it just comes back to what it was, and in between. So the psi squared just sloshes around. This is just the Schrodinger evolution of psi squared. All right. This follows from the Schrodinger equation. Equally, I could have derived this from the continuity equation. Remember, the Schrodinger equation implies a continuity equation for psi squared. 
Um, more generally, I could look at the continuity equation for rho in De Bruyne-Bohm theory, where in principle rho can be different from psi squared. But if rho happens to be equal to psi squared, I integrate that continuity equation, I'll get the same thing. I'll get the same thing. All right. What happens if instead I take an initial distribution that is different from psi squared at t is zero? What will happen? We can find out by integrating this equation. Now, this is something that is meaningless in standard quantum mechanics. You can't begin with a distribution that's different from psi squared. In this theory, you can. Psi squared obeys the Schrodinger equation. Rho generally obeys this continuity equation where the initial condition could be arbitrary. And we can integrate that equation to find out how rho evolves. So let's look at an example. Let us take, so we've got the two-dimensional box. We're going to take, we've got the same initial wave function, a superposition of 16 modes. We have the actual initial, the actual initial density is given by this sine squared in x and y, which happens to be equal to the square of the ground state wave function. There's no particular significance to that. It's just a, just a, a simple initial uh, density to the, 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 the looks, you know, that the, the one could, could, um, could try. Note the actual wave function is a superposition of modes so that the energy states here, the usual sign, these are just the energy states for a particle in a two-dimensional box. The wave function is a superposition. I've taken M is 16, superposition of the first 16 modes. Here we have initial phases, which we've just chosen randomly. At T is 0, we just choose some phases randomly uh, on 0, 2 pi, and then, of course, they're just fixed there, thereafter. Okay? So here, here is the wave function, a superposition of 16 modes, whereas my initial density is the square of the ground state wave functions. The initial density is totally different from psi squared. So here we have, here in the top, this is my initial density, rho. Here is my initial psi squared. Okay, completely different. What happens as we evolve forward in time? Well, we already know how psi squared evolves, just from the Schrodinger equation. I've already showed you that. What happens if I integrate the continuity equation for rho beginning with this density? This is what you find after half a period. After one period, look at that. The system relaxes to equilibrium. This uh, simulation was done uh, with Hans Westman. Uh, we published this in the Proceedings of the Royal Society in 2005. Um, I was actually amazed at how efficient the relaxation was over just one period. Look how close, you know, just by eye. I mean, you know, you see that maybe this is very slightly different, but, but very close after just one time period. But note something. The density here on the top, we've done some coarse graining. I'm going to talk a bit more about this, but if you look, here is a close-up of what the density looks like at 0.006% of the area of the box. We're looking at a tiny little, tiny little area of the box. The density has a lot of fine-grained microstructure. But if you coarse grain over that, um, th this, is what, this is what you see. There's a, so there's some coarse graining here, which I'll talk about more. Um, <coughs> I don't know, really, I've gone the wrong way. Okay. Um, okay, so here, here's a reference for those interested in seeing exactly how this simulation was done. Um, so now we have, well, here's potentially an answer. Remember the question that we had. Experimentally, we always see, you go in the lab, you always see the Born rule. Why? From a De Bruyne Bohm point of view, you can say, well, because of quantum relaxation. Quantum relaxation in De Bruyne-Bohm theory explains the Born rule. The Born probability rule, um, in my view, is not a law of nature. We see it because we are stuck in this state of statistical equilibrium. Why are we stuck in equilibrium? Well, everything we can see has a long and violent history, ultimately an astrophysical history. Um, think, for instance, let's go in the lab and pick out a hydrogen atom. 
It hasn't been sitting in the lab in a vacuum for 14 billion years. It has a history. It's been interacting with other things. Uh, the Earth form, the early formula formation of the solar system, the formation of stars, galaxies. It has a history that actually traces back to the Big Bang. It has a long and violent astrophysical history. There's been plenty of time for this relaxation process to occur. So if this relaxation process is, 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 is pretty general, as, as, as I think it is, and I'll show you a bit more later, then you, know, you would expect that, well, if I go in the lab and pick out an atom, and it, of course it's going to be in equilibrium, and you should see the Born rule. So on this view, quantum theory is a special case of a wider physics, it's an effective description of a special state of statistical equilibrium, and we're in that state now because of past relaxation. Uh, all right. Some details. Let me talk a bit, bit of detail about quantum relaxation. Um, let me just review quickly the classical coarse-graining H theorem for an isolated system. Um, one can define an H function on phase space. Lerville's theorem tells us that the density in phase space is actually preserved along trajectories. So this H function is actually constant in time. But it decreases under coarse graining. If I divide phase space up into little cells and average the densities over the cells and define a coarse grained H function, then this, well, you say it decreases, let's say it's non increasing. Um, it's a straightforward theorem, a classical coarse graining H theorem, that this can, cannot increase, assuming, this theorem assumes, that at the initial time, there is no fine-grained microstructure. What do we mean? We mean that the coarse grained density is the same as the fine-grained density. Okay. One can construct an analogous coarse graining H theorem for de Broglie-Bohm theory, but now it's on configuration space. This H function, uh, those of you who know about these things might recognize this as minus the relative entropy of two densities, rho and psi squared. But notice this is on configuration space. There is an analog of the Lerville theorem, which is the following. If I define a quantity F that is the ratio of rho to psi squared, that quantity is constant along trajectories, where now we're talking about a de Broglie-Bohm trajectory, not a classical trajectory. So here's a homework problem. So by the way, it's something I wanted to mention at the beginning and forgot. In this talk, I'm going to be, hopefully, get across the basic mechanics of how this theory works. And I'm thinking, I mean, I understand that there's going to be an exam. So here's a little tip for the students, you know, the sort of thing that will be on the exam is the sort of thing about the basic mechanics of how this theory works. And I'm going to insert a few little homework problems here and there just to help you get your head around these things. I'm also going to throw in some topics, um, you know, more advanced research topics with, without really any detail. Obviously, I hope it's clear from the context, they're not examinable. They sort of give you a bigger picture and, and why this is interesting and exciting or at least why I find it interesting and exciting. Okay, so here's the first homework problem. Homework. We've got the continuity equation for rho, the continuity equation for psi squared. They obey the same continuity equation. Show that this ratio f is constant along trajectories, where the time derivative along a trajectory is just partial by dt plus v dot uh, gradient, okay, this is just the, the time derivative along the trajectory. It simply follows from those two continuity equations that that ratio is constant along trajectories. All right, so we've got an analog of the Lerville theorem. Um, this actually implies, similarly to the classical case, that the exact h is constant in time. However, you can show something I showed in, in a paper in um, 1991, that this, um, this decreases under coarse graining, assuming, again, that the initial density rho has no fine-grained microstructure and that psi squared is also smooth uh, at the level of the coarse graining cells. If there's no fine-grained microstructure, then this uh, uh, decreases or at least cannot increase. Notice um, pilot wave theory is a time reversal invariant dynamics, as is Newtonian mechanics. In any time reversal invariant dynamics, it is impossible to prove 
that all initial conditions relax. It's impossible because I can always do a time reversal for every initial condition that relaxes. I can do a time reversal and have an initial condition that evolves away from equilibrium. So any demonstration or argument for relaxation has to assume something about the initial conditions. The assumption we're making here is that at the initial time there's no fine-grained microstructure. Remember I showed you in that first relaxation simulation, I showed you a close-up of the density with that very filamentary structure. The time, if you begin with a density that has no fine-grained microstructure, it very quickly develops fine-grained structure. Okay? So, um, so if you said, well, let's take the final state and time reverse it, well, the final state has fine-grained microstructure and breaks this initial condition. So this is actually just similar to what you have uh, in, in the classical theory in phase space. Well, analogous, analogous. Um, all right. So, well, okay, I've already said this. So beware of unnecessary controversy. You need assumptions about the initial conditions in order to, to argue for relaxation. The same in the classical theory. So like its classical analog, so this edge theory provides an, a mechanism in terms of which you can understand how equilibrium is approached. But of course, by itself, it doesn't prove that equilibrium is actually reached. The main evidence rests on numerical simulations, uh, which I'll show you more of. Um, all right. Now, this um, H function, the coarse-grained H function, is useful to quantify relaxation. As I said, it is minus the relative entropy. Of, of, of rho and psi squared. It obeys these convenient properties. It's bounded from below by zero. Um, and it's equal to zero if and only if rho is psi squared. Those of you who are keen, I didn't put this as a homework problem, maybe I should have, maybe you can show this. You have to use this, this inequality here. Um, using this inequality, you can derive these properties. They're just properties of minus the relative entropy of any two distributions anyway. It's, it's just a... Okay, now what is interesting is that numerical simulations show an approximate, I should have put in approxi an approximate exponential decay of the coarse-grained H function. So here, for the same example of the two-dimensional box that I showed you earlier, here is a plot of the log of the coarse-grained H against T, and you see that there is an approximate exponential decay. Um, similar behavior in independent simulations. Here is a comparable simulation um, for a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator. We started with an initial state of the first 25 energy states superposed. Um, just to confuse you, I now have time running downwards. So here I have the initial psi squared, and it evolves in time going downwards. Okay, here I have... Um, I don't remember now. I think that in our units, the period here was 2 pi. So here we have 10, 5 periods. You may think, but hang on, it's periodic. These are actually the same. It's just the scaling is different. Um, just the scaling is different, but this is actually a periodic system. So anyway, here's psi squared evolving in time. We took our initial row to be a Gaussian. Took the initial row to be a Gaussian. Completely different. This is the, the probability density. This is psi squared. Completely different. As rho evolves, you see again the remarkable uh, relaxation towards equilibrium. Here is now a plot of the coarse-grained H function against time. You see there's approximately exponential decay. Um, broadly speaking, relaxation is faster when there are larger numbers of modes in the superposition. If you're wondering about the time scale, it's a bit complicated, but very crudely, as a very sort of crude guideline, it's of order the time scale over which the wave function itself evolves. Um, you might be wondering about what the trajectories look like. You know, this is, we have an ensemble here of initial positions, and we're evolving the trajectories for each to see how the ensemble moves. The trajectories are very complicated. Remember, these are trajectories, the velocity is proportional to the gradient of the phase of the wave function. But the wave function is a superposition of different energy states. You get these very rapid, erratic Trajectories. This is for the case of the two-dimensional box. Um, the the uh, neighboring, initial neighboring initial points tend to diverge. Here are two points that started um, 
close to the middle of the box, with a very small separation, and here are the final positions. You see, you know, there's a, there's a divergence of neighboring trajectories. So that's what's, you know, just give you a sense of what's going on behind the scenes here. The, the, the trajectories are running around in the box, and, um, and from the point of view of the ensemble, you get a rapid relaxation to quantum equilibrium. So you can think of this being, you know, a little bit like in classical physics, I, I have a box of gas, I start out with the molecules in one corner of the box, I let it go, the molecules bounce around, they spread over the box, relaxation to thermal equilibrium. It's a, analogous, but very different to thermal relaxation. Um, now note something, people often ask, well, you say we, you know, we're, things have relaxed, we see the Born rule now, we're in equilibrium, can't we escape? from equilibrium? Can't we knock something out of equilibrium? Well, as far as anyone can understand, once equilibrium is reached in this theory, we are stuck there, except for possible extremely rare fluctuations, which is pretty much like, you know, sitting by the beach and, and waiting for the ocean to start spontaneously boiling. It could happen in principle, but don't hold your breath. Um, another possibility, actually, something I've studied, and this is, this, is, this is very speculative, of course some people say, well, you're already very speculative, so maybe this is very, very speculative. Anyway, um, that in the presence of gravity, um, remember I talked about that quantum equilibrium theorem, you, if the initial density is psi squared, it stays equal to psi squared. That proof relies on the existence of a continuity equation uh, that, that, that comes from the Schrodinger equation. There are reasons for thinking that this whole construction might break down in the presence of gravity. For example, in the presence of black, evaporating black holes, or in quantum gravity, in the deep quantum gravity regime. Um, those of you who know about these things, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, the analog of the Schrodinger equation, is a timeless Schrodinger-like equation. There's a big controversy about how to define the probabilities. There's no well-defined probability current. I have suggested that, there, that perhaps in quantum gravity there is no such thing as a quantum equilibrium state. And so there's a sense in which gravitational effects could in principle knock a system out of equilibrium. Maybe. But if we're ignoring gravity, we're just talking about standard de Broglie-Bohm theory with a standard time-dependent Schrodinger equation with a conserved current. Once you're in equilibrium, it seems that you're stuck. Um, all right, so I've said that quantum theory is an effective description of a special state. We're in that special state today because, according to this uh, theory, at least the way I interpret it, because of past relaxation. When did relaxation happen? Well, presumably a very long time ago. As I said, you know, you can, we, uh, cosmologists and astrophysicists have traced back the history of all the systems we see back some 14 billion years to a very violent Big Bang. So presumably, if the universe began out of equilibrium, you would, have, you would expect it's going to relax to equilibrium very quickly. So if, that, if this is all true, then the following statement is accurate. The quantum noise, or the Born probability rule that we see, is actually a relic of the Big Bang on this view, if, if the relaxation took place in the very early universe, then quantum noise is a relic of the Big Bang. Now, if all of this is true, you could expect that quantum theory will break down close to the Big Bang. Now, um, I'm not going to go into this here. I'll talk a little bit about this later. But in, in, according to inflationary cosmology, the, so this is a, a, a picture of, of the, uh, the temperature anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background. According to inflationary cosmology, those small anisotropies were ultimately seeded by quantum fluctuations in the very early universe. And the statistical properties uh, of that pattern reflects, directly reflects statistical properties of the Born probability rule for the inflaton field in the very early universe. If all that is true, then you can consider what would happen if, the, uh, if, at, if at early times the inflaton field uh, violates the Born rule, and you can obtain corrections to the expected spectrum uh, for the microwave background. This is discussed in a paper I published uh, in 2010. Um, all right. Here's something I want to talk about now. Moving on. Um, um, I've mentioned that um, 
you know, most people just regard the Born probability rule as a third postulate in pilot wave theory. I think that's incorrect. Um, I think it, it, it emerged from past relaxation. And there's an interesting parallel between what, what I've been saying and what some people were talking about in the late 19th century. Some people were getting very depressed, wondering, you know, they understood the laws of thermodynamics, and they were saying, well, everything is running down, eventually the stars will burn out, all systems in the universe will reach the same temperature, we will no longer be able to convert heat into useful work, because you need differences of temperature. They call this the heat death of the universe. Maybe it will happen one day. It hasn't happened yet. My claim is that according to pilot wave theory, a sub-quantum analogue of the classical heat death has actually happened already in our universe. And this explains many of the puzzling peculiarities and restrictions that we see in quantum mechanics. All systems are in equilibrium today because of past quantum relaxation. This has an implication. If the Born rule is universally true, something I haven't discussed yet, but I will, is that an implication of the Born rule in pilot wave theory is that you can no longer convert entanglement into useful superluminal signals. So something I haven't mentioned yet, the Broibohm theory for many body system is a non-local theory. In general, the motion, if I have two particles that are entangled, the motion of this particle depends instantaneously on what this other particle is doing. If I change the Hamiltonian locally here, the velocity of this particle responds instantaneously. However, if you are in quantum equilibrium, these effects are averaged, in a, in a sense they average to zero and you can no longer actually use them to send a signal. So I see a parallel here between you know, the classical heat death, when all systems are at the same temperature, you can no longer convert heat into useful work. In what I call the quantum heat death, when all systems obey the, board, the equilibrium Born rule, you can no longer use entanglement to send superluminal signals. I'm going to talk more about that. Um, but before I do, let me just say something. Uh, why would anyone believe this? So here are actually the reasons why I got interested in this. This slide is, is a bit, bit of a personal slide. He said, as you, why would anyone believe this? The title of this slide could have been, why did I ever get involved with this? So, well, one thing this, uh, this idea is it explains why there's a universal quantum noise. All right, fair enough. But it also explains, and this is what I, I found at the beginning particularly interesting, uh, it explains the peculiar conspiracy in modern physics. I'm very glad to see uh, Karl Zvotsil uh, sitting in the back over in the corner. I actually lived in Vienna um, for a couple of years, from 87 to 89. I was working here just independently, sitting in cafes, thinking about the foundations of quantum mechanics, and often talking to Carl. And uh, we were interested in why it is, you know, there are, there are these funny people, there's some kind of non-locality in quantum mechanics. Um, now I would say now that, well, Bell's theorem allows us to deduce the existence of non-locality in nature. But, no matter how you fiddle around, you cannot use non-locality for non-local signaling. Why not? Of course, back in the late 80s, discussing with Carl, you know, there were, there were those with the early beginning of the no-cloning theorem, which actually arose historically as, as, as an answer. Someone had cooked up a way in which you might use entanglement for non-local signaling, and it turns out that scenario doesn't work because of the no-cloning theorem. So there's always this, you know, it's as if something is going on behind the scenes. There's something non-local about quantum mechanics, but you can't control it. You can't observe it directly, and you can't use it to send a signal. So it's as if there are these spooky, spooky non-local connections are there, but they're hidden somehow. Why? Why, why, why? This, to me, has always struck me as a conspiracy. Now, of course, one man's conspiracy could be one another man's law of physics. Some people say, well, it's just the law of physics. You know, you've got these non-local, these peculiar, stronger-than-classical correlations, but 
uh, it's a fundamental principle of physics, you can't signal faster than light, and it, that's just how it works. I always found this unsatisfactory. It seemed, it feels to me as if, especially of course, if you believe in hidden variables, well then there really are non-local effects occurring. And the only reason why we can't signal faster than light is because we can't control the hidden variables. So, pilot wave theory provides an explanation for this conspiracy. And this is how it goes. is that signal locality uh, is just a peculiarity of the equilibrium state. So, just like in classical physics, if everything is at the same temperature, I can't convert heat into work. That's not a law, it's not a fundamental constraint. Of course, in general, you can convert heat into work, but in that particular state where everything's at the same temperature, it so happens you can't convert heat into work. Similarly here in pilot wave theory, here, here we have, imagine I have two entangled, I have a pair of entangled particles, one in one box, one in another box, and then I have an ensemble of pairs. So this picture here is, is an ensemble of pairs of entangled particles. And let's imagine that we change the Hamiltonian uh, over, over on the right here. Maybe you, you push the walls of the box, move the walls of the box. In pilot wave theory, you can show quite straightforwardly that the velocities of the particles in the other box will respond instantaneously to the change in the Hamiltonian over there, no matter how far away these boxes are. And you can calculate uh, what happens for an ensemble, what happens to the marginal distribution of, if I'm just interested in the positions of these particles, and I calculate the time evolution of the marginal distribution, what you find is that while some of the particles move this way, some of the particles move that way, if you're in equilibrium, then the marginal distribution is actually unchanged. Um, whereas if you were out of equilibrium, the marginal distribution here does change, and you could send non-local signals using, if you had access to an ensemble of particles uh, in quantum non-equilibrium. So let me give you some detail here. So first of all, non-locality in pilot wave dynamics. Here's a, a two-particle system. In configuration space, the law of motion is local. It's just the Velocity is given by the local gradient of phase. When I look at this in ordinary three space, you find that if the wave function is entangled, then the velocity of one particle depends if I, if I, if this particle A, if I move it, here yeah, I perhaps haven't drawn this very well, but if I imagine move, if I could move this particle, the velocity of the other particle changes from the black line to the red line. Um, you can easily, you know, have, maybe have a check of this here more explicitly. Let's say I have two particles A and B with these positions. It can be widely separated. Let the wave function be entangled. Then the phase of the wave function will not be a separable function of X A and X B. In other words, the phase is not a function of A plus a function of B. It doesn't take the separable form. Then the velocity of particle A at time T will in general depend on the instantaneous position of the other particle, no matter how far away it may be. And furthermore, if you change the local Hamiltonian at B, it will affect the velocity at A instantaneously. Um, and if you affect the velocity at A instantaneously, so here I've drawn a picture here where I'm imagining that at box B I change the Hamiltonian from H to something plus delta H. This leads to non-equilibrium, non-local signaling. And let me show you uh, some details of the calculation. For non-equilibrium, non-local signaling, I imagine, here I have again, I've got pairs of entangled particles. The wave function, the initial wave function is an entangled state. Phi 1 and phi 2 are just energy states for each box. So I've got, a, I've got an entangled state uh, for the pairs of particles. Let's assume that the initial joint distribution of the particle positions is not psi squared. It's a non-equilibrium distribution. And let's consider what happens if the Hamiltonian at B undergoes a sudden change. Switch on a potential, some perturbation, move the walls of the box, whatever. And let's calculate the time evolution of the joint distribution over time t. Remember, we have a formalism 
where given an initial density that's not psi squared, I can integrate the continuity equation and, and, and find out how it evolves in time. So we can calculate the time evolution of the joint distribution. Once we've done that, we can then look at the marginal distribution at A and see how that evolves. So here's what it looks like. So here's something. So for those of you who want to see the details, I have a paper in Physics Letters A in 1991. Um, so here, here's the, the punchline, if you like, the punchline of, of the calculation. So uh, perhaps I should mention that this entangled state here, the taking the energy wave functions to be real, the phase of this wave function is independent of position, is just an energy times time. So the de Broglie velocities are initially zero. Um, the de Broglie velocity for this wave function vanishes. So in other words, the particles here in the box are just sitting still. All right. Now, um, what happens if, after a small time t, if I change the Hamiltonian over here, the, after a small time t, the marginal distribution at A changes. After a small time t, you can calculate explicitly the change in the marginal distribution here is given by this expression for small t. Where these quantities A and B depend on the initial wave function, of the, of, the, of, the, of the pair and on the change in the Hamiltonian at B. Okay? But you can knock the expression into this form. It depends on an integral over the difference between the initial density and the initial psi squared. In other words, if you're initially in equilibrium, there's no effect, which of course has to be because you just recover the quantum predictions, the marginal distribution here, I have an entangled system, change the Hamiltonian here, the marginal distribution of the positions here doesn't change. Of course not. Whereas if you're out of equilibrium, if P is not equal to psi squared, then in general there is a change in the marginal distribution over here, non-locally, no matter how widely separated these systems are. So this idea, so here's, you know, there's the background here, you, you change the Hamiltonian over there, you can send a superluminal signal at the statistical level, if you are out of equilibrium. Whereas, these non whereas if you're in equilibrium, these non-local effects average out to zero, and the marginal, each individual uh, particle here does respond instantaneously to what happens over there, but over an ensemble, if you're in equilibrium, the actual marginal distribution doesn't change. Okay? Um, all right. Um, now, here is something... Let's see, it's five past five. Okay, some people worry that, hang on, that means you've got uh, signals faster than light. Um, you could use that to synchronize clocks across the universe instantaneously, define an absolute time. Indeed, according to this theory, at the fundamental level, there is an absolute simultaneity. The dynamics has to be defined with respect to a preferred time parameter. Um, when you do quantum field theory, which I'm not really going to go, well, I'll go into it maybe briefly later, but in this theory, it's defined with respect to a preferred frame. The non-locality of the underlying equations does uh, define an absolute simultaneity. Same in curved space-time. You may think, how are we going to do this in curved space-time? Well, actually, there's a general, well, maybe consensus is a little strong, but let's say it's generally thought that physical solutions of the Einstein equations are globally hyperbolic, which just means they can be foliated by space-like hypersurfaces. So you can assume in pilot wave theory that one of those foliations is the true foliation. Um, so you can do quantum field theory in a background curve space-time without any problem. In equilibrium, you recover the usual predictions of quantum field theory. Those predictions are Lorentz covariant. And so, um, in equilibrium, you recover an effective or emergent Lorentz invariance, which is true only in equilibrium. Just as um, the absence of superluminal signaling is true only in equilibrium, Lorentz invariance itself comes out to be true only in equilibrium. Um, now, you may worry about all this. What kind of crazy theory is this? A theory with a preferred frame. Actually, 
Um, this is a very natural feature of pilot wave theory because remember that the law of motion is a law of motion for velocity, not for acceleration. And I've argued in a paper that this means that actually um, the, um, the natural motions in this theory are rest. So in a second order theory like Newtonian mechanics, the laws of motion are laws for acceleration. The natural states of motion are uniform velocity in a straight line. And the natural kinematics of the theory is Galilean. Um, in my view, um, and I should say I'm at odds here with, a, with an influential school that, that regards Galilean invariance as a symmetry of the theory, I think it's all wrong. Boost invariance is a fictitious symmetry. Um, I could maybe, without, you know, it would take a long discussion to go into this, but perhaps I can make the case just by this analogy. Imagine here on the right-hand side, you've got Newton's law, Newton's law of motion. And let's transform to an accelerated frame of reference. If I change the forces, if I introduce what are usually called fictitious forces, I can make Newton's law appear to be invariant. Now, most people would say, well, this is a fictitious invariant. Newton's laws are invariant under translations, velocity boosts, you wouldn't regard this as part of the physical invariance group. Why not? Because here you've introduced what is called a fictitious force. Why is it fictitious? Because it's proportional to the mass. Why does that make it fictitious? Well, it means that it affects all particles equally, which suggests that really it's a kinematical effect. Okay? It's, it's, it's really what you've done here. You're in a theory where, um, um, you know, you, you've... Well where it's invariant under velocity boosts, but not acceleration boosts. This is an artificial, fictitious invariance. The mathematics is exactly the same, but just down one order. If I have a theory that is a theory of velocities, not accelerations, and I imagine a boost to a, a moving frame, um, there is a transformation of the wave function the, the, according to which the gradient of the phase picks up a term that looks like the mass times the velocity of the boost. And you can make the de Broglie equation of motion look invariant. In my view, this is a fictitious invariance, just as this is a fictitious invariance because of the, the, this, this thing that's proportional to the mass. Uh, I'm not sure if that's been terribly illuminating, but if you're interested in the full argument... Uh, I have a paper from 1997. But so my message is that actually it is in, in a dynamics based on velocities, it is natural actually to have a preferred state of rest. So the idea that in general out of equilibrium you can super signal superluminally and define an absolute time actually fits. There's an internal logic to this theory. Of course this theory may well be completely wrong. It's all maybe it's true. But it is interesting that it does have this internal logic. Um, all right, so here, let me now just summarize a bit. So I've got another 45, 50 minutes. Good. So let me summarize a bit the big picture of what I've been saying. I'm saying that quantum theory is, whoops, is a special case of a much wider physics. When you have quantum theory, you have the Born rule, you have locality, you have the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle just reflects the statistics of the Born rule. Um, but more generally, there is a wider physics of non-equilibrium where the Born rule is violated, um, where you can have non-local signaling, and the theory is in principle deterministic. And the general physics is out here. The physics that we see is in here. Why are we stuck in here? We're stuck in here, I claim, because of some relaxation process that took place presumably in the very early universe. All right, so at this point, I should talk a bit about... Um, it's all very well, you know, coming up with theories that sound interesting, but at the end of the day, physics is, is an empirical science. We have to uh, make an effort to look for evidence uh, for our theories. So, the big question here is, if this is true, where could we find this wider physics? It's all very well to say, well, okay, you have a consistent picture. Perhaps this is true, but how can we prove it? Where's the, is there any evidence for this wider physics? So, 
where might we find quantum non-equilibrium? So, um, well, let me just say, I'd mentioned something about if there are exotic gravitational effects, then, then you know, that opens up a whole other discussion. I'm not going to talk about that here. What I'm going to talk about here is that, well, if it's the case that we're stuck in here because of past relaxation, and that this relaxation took place in the early universe, well, then let's look at the early universe and see if we can find evidence for this relaxation. So... Some studies, I'll show a little bit more of some simulations we've done. It turns out that on expanding space, relaxation can be suppressed at long wavelengths. Here I'm talking about um, in field theory, I have a scalar field evolving on expanding space. The relaxation can be suppressed at long wavelengths. So there's actually a natural mechanism in this theory for the suppression of quantum noise at large cosmological scales in the early universe. It turns out that in the cosmic microwave background, there is a reported power deficit at large scales, which, um, you know, qualitatively speaking, fits with the kind of thing uh, that we're talking about. Um, so there, there are possible signatures of quantum relaxation in the early universe in the cosmic microwave background, something that's still being studied. Another possibility is that, well, if relaxation took place in the very early universe, what happened? imagine if there were some particles at very early times that decoupled very early. For example, gravitinos, a hypothetical particle that come up a lot in, in supersymmetric theories. They're a widely discussed candidate for dark matter. It is believed that a, um, some, some 25 or so percent uh, of the, the universe out there actually consists of dark matter. These could be, there are some of the leading theories of what dark matter is say that these consist of particles that decoupled at very early times. It is conceivable, and I've discussed this in, in, a, in this paper, that, um, that, if these, that, 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 that if those particles decoupled sufficiently early, they would not have had time to reach equal quantum equilibrium, and they could be floating around today and still be out of equilibrium. If we could detect those particles and do experiments with them, it's conceivable that they would violate the Born, the born rule. So there are these sort of broad brush, um, some possibilities that, that have been studied, um, let me just show you a little bit this first idea, this suppression of relaxation on expanding space. I've shown you some simulations of relaxation for the particle in a two-dimensional box and for a particle in a two-dimensional oscillator potential. Similar simulations have been done on expanding space. Um, those of you familiar with cosmology can consider a, a flat expanding space. The scale factor is, is telling you how... Uh, space is expanding. The case we looked at has a scale factor proportional to t to the half, which is valid for a radiation-dominated universe. Um, you don't need to know much about this. Let me just tell you the essential is that we're looking at a free massless scalar field. We're looking at its Fourier components, which can be written in terms of a real and imaginary part. So for one Fourier component, I've got a two-dimensional system. I have two real degrees of freedom. And if I have a Fourier mode that's decoupled, so the wave functional for the whole system is equal to a wave function for that mode multiplied by a wave function for the rest, I can study relaxation for these two real degrees of freedom on expanding space. The details are in two papers uh, with Samuel Collin, who was a, a postdoc I had in Clemson uh, uh, not long ago. This is what you find. Here we have, um, this is, so here I have, this is psi squared. Here is the time evolution going downwards of the quantum density. This is basically, that's something I should have mentioned actually, that for this system, it turns out that the equations for a decoupled mode on expanding space look exactly like the equations for a simple harmonic oscillator, except the mass is given by the cube of the scale factor. And the angular frequency is, is, is inversely proportional to the scale factor. In other words, mathematically, you've got a two-dimensional oscillator with a time-dependent mass and a time-dependent angular frequency. Um, so here you have the quantum density. This is for a superposition of the first 25 modes of this effective oscillator. 
This is psi squared evolving in time according to the Schrodinger equation. Okay? Here is our initial density, which is taken to be a Gaussian. And you see that it evolves towards equilibrium, but it doesn't quite get there. This was over a certain period of time. You see that it's it sort of the variant, the width, of the width of the, of the actual distribution is smaller than the quantum width. Okay? So it's evolved towards, towards equilibrium, but it doesn't quite get there. Let's do the same calculation, but without expanding, with, on no expanding space. So in other words, this is just a regular two-dimensional oscillator. Here is psi squared evolving. Here is the initial Gaussian, non-equilibrium, evolving. And you see it very accurately evolves towards equilibrium. Okay. Let's put these now two side by side. I've got the same initial conditions. I evolve over the same time period. If there's no expanding space, I relax very closely to equilibrium. If space is expanding, you see there's a suppression of relaxation. I should have mentioned that the, the mode that we're looking at here has a wavelength that is larger than the Hubble radius. Those who know what that is, fine. Those who don't, never mind. But the, it turns out that this suppression takes place for wa long wavelength modes whose physical wavelength is larger than the Hubble radius. Whereas at short wavelengths, you recover the usual rapid relaxation. So there is um, a sub this theory predicts, the dynamics of this theory predicts that, look, at short wavelengths, you're going to get this rapid relaxation to equilibrium. At very long wavelengths, this relaxation is suppressed. So you would make a prediction, that the, the, the details are discussed in these papers, that there is, you expect to see a deficit in the variance of the distribution at long wavelengths, which, if you look at the way inflationary cosmology works and the way the fluctuations in the inflaton field generate the statistics of the microwave background, the implication is that you would have a large-scale power deficit in the CMB. A deficit of this qualitative form has, in fact, been reported, though it is, I should add, somewhat controversial. Um, uh, the dynamics of this model actually predicts that the variance will vary with wavelength as an inverse tangent as a function of the wave number. So we actually have a prediction, a detailed prediction uh, for what this power deficit should look like at long wavelengths. And we're currently uh, comparing with data and, um, and, and you know, I'll, I'll come back to you another time. Um, the data are... Um, as I said, um, full of noise in this long wavelength region, full of uncertainties. Um, some people think there is evidence for power deficit, others are not so sure. So, you know, it's, um, it's a tricky area to work in, but still, we're doing what we can. Um, all right. So there is, um, I think I've talked enough about quantum relaxation, about my view that we're stuck in this quantum heat death. Um, but in principle, we could signal faster than light if we we're out of equilibrium, but we can't because we're stuck in equilibrium. I've shown you something about the dynamics of this theory, of, of how non-local it is, how the non-locality is erased in effect when you're in equilibrium. Um, I haven't talked about quantum measurements yet. The only concrete um, example of a quantum experiment I've shown you has been the two-slit experiment. So let me show you now, in a sense, we're going to come down to Earth leave cosmology. Let's talk a bit about quantum measurements. How does this theory um, uh, account for the usual quantum measurement theory? Okay, so um, it is actually really very simple that you can reduce all experiments to position measurements. The position of this pointer, did it point this way or that way? I have a needle on, a, on, a, on, a, on an apparatus. I have a dot. You know, in the two-slit experiment, you, 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 know, you, you, you have electrons coming out, they get all photons, and they land somewhere. There's a little blip somewhere on a screen. What's the position of that blip? It's the positions of things. Um, you can reduce experiment. You don't have to talk. In principle, even, I mean, here I'm just talking about standard quantum mechanics. You don't have to talk about momentum, energy, spin, or the stern gerlach experiment. I fire an electron through the magnet. It just can't, it lands somewhere. It either goes up or it goes down. Okay? I can reduce all my data to position measurements.
So strictly speaking, even in standard quantum mechanics, if you have the Born rule for positions, that suffices to make the, all the predictions that you need. It may not be a very convenient way to do it, but in principle, you can do that. Now, what happens, we know that when you make a, a measurement, um, if I have a system and I have an apparatus, together they have a total configuration. Here I have a wave function, just schematically a wave function for my system and my apparatus. There is a configuration that includes, for example, a pointer position. As the Schrodinger evolution goes on, the wave function develops branches, and if you just have the Schrodinger equation, I get non-overlapping branches corresponding to different positions of the pointer. And of course, there's a superposition of such branches, and in quantum mechanics, um, there is this issue of, well, how do we, why do we only see one outcome? In De Broglie-Bohm theory, it's straightforward. Uh, the actual system and the actual pointer has a definite configuration which begins somewhere in here and it evolves according to the quantum equation of motion. The way I've drawn it, if it begins here, it ends up in this branch. If it had started somewhere else, it would have ended up in the other branch. Okay? Now, but in any single run of the experiment, there is only one final configuration occupying only one of the non-overlapping branches. Now, some essential points, I'm going to go through a particular example of a von Neumann measurement, but essential points of, of you know, how, how does this really work, is that, as I said, you can reduce all experiments to position measurements. So really, in order to agree with quantum mechanics, I just need to show you that I can give you the correct probability distribution for the pointer positions. The probability distribution for the pointer positions is just a marginal distribution for the joint probability distribution of the whole thing, the system and the apparatus. In equilibrium, the Born distribution is just the same as in... we have the same Born distribution as in quantum mechanics. Hence, it's actually trivial Really, if, if, you know, if you think this through, you realize that, well, actually, of course we reproduce quantum mechanics. If you re reproduce the, the, the same probability distributions for positions of things, you necessarily obtain agreement with quantum mechanics. So, putting it succinctly, since all measurements can be reduced to position measurements, in principle, all we need is to reproduce the standard quantum distribution of positions. This point was emphasized by Bell, his book of 1987, Speakable or Unspeakable in Quantum Mechanics. The same point was actually made by Feynman and Hibbs in the 60s. They have a lovely book called The Path Integral Formulation of Quantum Mechanics. And they do path integrals just in configuration space. And then there's a chapter where they say, well, now let's talk about momentum. They say, well, I can reduce momentum measurements to position measurements. So, for instance, I have a particle in a box. I open it. After a long time, I measure its position. Boom. I will say, ah, you know, the time of flight method will say, well, the distance traveled divided by the time gives me a velocity and multiplied by the mass. I've measured the momentum. They show how from, basically from, if I have the correct probability distribution for the position of the particle, so I open this particles in a box, I want to measure its momentum, open the box, let the particle fly out, after a certain time I measure its position. If I know the probability distribution for these positions, I can convert that into a probability distribution for the measured momenta, and I get agreement with the usual quantum formalism. All right, that's the, the sort of vague um, outline of how this works. Let's discuss in detail now um, a von Neumann measurement. Let's say we have a system. I'm just going to take it with a you know, one-dimensional Simple, it just has a coordinate x, one-dimensional degree of freedom. Let us say I'm interested in some observable omega, which in quantum mechanics is represented by an operator, omega. And here, these phi's are the eigenfunctions of the operator with eigenvalues, omega. Let the initial wave function of the system be a superposition of these um, eigenfunctions. Let the system now interact with a pointer. I have a pointer with a coordinate y 
And I want that coordinate to indicate for me the value of, of this uh, observable omega. Um, here's what von Neumann did. He said, well, let's introduce an interaction Hamiltonian that is a constant times the observable you're measuring times an operator that is just the momentum conjugate to the pointer position. And what I do, I take this constant to be large so that during the interaction I can neglect the actual Hamiltonians of the system and the pointer. So the Hamiltonian is dominated by this term here. So during the interaction, the Schrodinger equation looks like this. So if I have an initial joint wave function, I have my superposition of states for the system multiplied by some wave packet. For instance, I could assume that the initial packet for the pointer may be some little narrow Gaussian. Okay, here's my initial joint wave function. Um, this wave function evolves in accordance with the Schrodinger equation. This is the time evolution. It evolves into a sum of non-overlapping packets. This is just standard, you know, quantum theory of the von Neumann measurement. Um, here's a plot of what... So this is a sum, you know, if, if the time t is large enough, these, if, and if G0 is a narrow Gaussian... After a sufficiently large time, these, Gaussian, these, these alternative packets no longer overlap. And if I look at the probability density in configuration space, I just get a sum of terms that look like this. So these are regions of non-zero probability. So here is x and here is y. So there's a, there's, this is just the width, delta y is just the width of the pointer packet. The point, I've got this separation into uh, different packets now. All right, that's just standard, uh, standard stuff. So now in pilot wave theory, the final configuration is going to be somewhere, it can only be in one place. It's going to be in one of these packets. Only one packet contains the actual final configuration. And the result is that at the end of the experiment, the system is in fact guided by a reduced wave function. Why? This depends on two key features. So here's some more homework for you to check. If I have a sum of non-overlapping packets, the phase gradient, which gives the de Broglie velocity field, depends only on the occupied packet. I mean, I'm saying something very simple. If I have a wave function, there's a sum of a, a packet here plus a packet here. Um, if the actual configuration is in this packet, and I want to calculate the velocity of this configuration, I take the gradient of the phase at this point. That will not depend on this other packet. In effect, it's just given by the gradient of the phase of this one packet. You can check that. Similarly, if the occupied packet is a product like this, then because the velocity field is given by the gradient of the phase, if the wave function is a product, the phase is a sum of functions, a function of x plus a function of y, and so the velocity of, the, of x depends only on the phase of this part here of the wave function. So the velocity is in effect determined by phi alone. So here's a homework. You can check this. Note something that at the end of the measurement we switch off the interaction Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonians are just the standard Hamiltonians for the system and the pointer. The de Broglie velocity field is just the standard phase gradient. So bear that in mind. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a good thing to go through. If you've not worked with this theory before, if you go through and check this, it will give you a sense of how, how the theory works. It's straightforward, but you know, it, it's new. If you've not seen this before, it's sort of different. So it will help you to, to get your mind around this if you go through this. So there we are. Um, so what you have is an effective collapse. Um, of course, the empty branches of the wave function are still there. They haven't gone away. It's just that the actual configuration is in one branch, and its behavior is then as if only this branch were present. But really, the other packets are still there elsewhere in configuration space. This effective collapse occurs with a probability. Well, if I want to know what is the probability to be in a particular packet, we're assuming equilibrium. So I just have to integrate the psi squared probability over this region. If I want to know what is the probability that I'll be in this packet, 
is just equal to the integral of psi squared over the support of this packet. So that is what this, this uh, integral is. This is the probability to be in the mth packet. I integrate over the support of the mth branch. Again, simple little homework problem, but a good thing to go through is check that, well, if I calculate this integral, where, of course, if I'm in a certain branch, then the wave function is just one branch, and it's a product of these two, two things, um, it's easy to show that, well, this integral is then given by this, and which just reduces to the usual result. The probability of being in the mth packet is just equal to the modular squared of the amplitude, where that amplitude appeared in this initial superposition. So I just recover the usual Born rule. Okay. Um, something that often puzzles people, something to be aware of in this theory. This theory is very different from standard quantum theory. It's very different in, in its details. It's very different from classical mechanics. Something that often puzzles people is that it turns out that in this theory, what you normally call a quantum measurement is generally actually not a correct measurement. What you've done, you've taken a system with a certain wave function, you've coupled it to a pointer with a certain wave function, this thing evolves, at the end you find that the pointer has this position, you interpret this as telling you, ah, therefore the system had a property with this value. In general, that's not true. It's generally true for positions, a standard quantum measurement of position is generally a correct measurement of position in this theory. Sorry, I've been pressing this by accident. Um, but, um, hang on, where was I? Oh, I've gone, hang on, I've gone completely. Um, sorry. Um, okay, so beware of eigenvalue realism. Position measurements are usually faithful. In other words, correct measurements of position. But momentum measurements, for example, are usually not. Um, something we can maybe talk about in the discussion. My claim is that actually this is to be expected. When we chose the interaction Hamiltonian between the system and the pointer, if you think about it, that Hamiltonian was chosen by analogy with classical physics. It's, it, it is... The quantum is the operator analog of the correct classical interaction Hamiltonian. If I was going to measure that observable for a classical system, I would choose that interaction Hamiltonian. Um, so, in, in, I mean, there's a long story about this that I could go into, but my claim is that quantum measurement theory is modeled by analogy with classical measurement theory. So, there's no reason to, to, to believe that it's actually the correct theory of measurement for a non-classical system. But in any case, you can discuss this. I can say, what happens if I have this system, I couple it in a certain way to this point of what happens, and this is what happens. But let me just show you an example of, 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 of where, you know, where the measurement of momentum is incorrect. Consider an initial wave function for the system that is what we would normally call a superposition of two equal and opposite momentum eigenvalues. The wave function is real. Um, the initial de Broglie momentum, sorry, I've gone and written this. Um, um, Taking, I think I'm taking unit mass, sorry, and I'm taking unit mass here, but in any way, the S by the X can be written as the imaginary part of uh, 1 over psi, the psi by the X. I've been writing the velocity field as a gradient of phase. Some people don't like that. They like to just write it directly in terms of psi. This is an equivalent, and you know, that's what I've written here. Anyway, this is just saying the, moment, the, the momentum is equal to the gradient of the phase um, it actually vanishes for this particular wave function that's real, the momentum vanishes. In other words, the Broglie-Bohm theory predicts that if I have a particle that's in a superposition 
of, uh, of, of two equal and opposite momentum eigenvalues, the actual de Broglie momentum is zero. It's actually sitting still. Let's now do what we did. Let's do a, von, a so-called von Neumann measurement of momentum. We couple it to a pointer using the von Neumann interaction Hamiltonian. The total joint wave function will separate into branches. The pointer will move one way or the other. The quantum, the, the person in the lab who believes quantum mechanics, when he sees the pointer move this way, he will say, ah, the particle had momentum plus P. If he sees the momentum the pointer move the other way, he says, ah, the particle had momentum minus P. According to the Broglie-Bohm theory, nothing of the kind. The particle was actually at rest. Okay? What happens after the measurement, the effective reduced wave function for the particle is then a momentum eigenstate, and the particle will then have momentum P or minus P, but its momentum at the beginning was actually zero. This aspect of the theory was first understood by Bohm uh, in 1952. Um, okay, so you may say, well, you know, I don't like this now. You're telling me that what we usually call measurements are not correct measurements. Well, remember, according to this theory, we're stuck in quantum equilibrium. But in principle, there's a wider physics of non-equilibrium, which most people don't discuss. But I think if you believe this theory, you have to take seriously. In quantum non-equilibrium, you can perform correct measurements. You can do things that you can't normally do. So let me talk a bit about that now. Um, so I have another 20 minutes, as far as I understand. OK, Bon Boltzmann, I just love this. <laughs> bon Boltzmann is, is watching me. OK. I, I don't know if he's turning in his grave. I once visited his grave in the, the, the Central Friedhof a long time ago. Anyway, um, where was I? All right, let's talk a bit about, imagine, let's say, hypothetically, that we discover tomorrow um, dark matter is made of gravitinos that decoupled at very early times and it turns out that they haven't relaxed to equilibrium, they violate quantum mechanics. Here is a cloud of particles. Let, oh, actually here I've given, just to keep things simple, let's say I have a cloud of hydrogen atoms and they've all, you know, they've been, you know, not interacting with anything, they've fallen into the ground state. I have a large number of hydrogen atoms in the ground state. So the equilibrium distribution of the R is just the radius, the position of the electron with respect to the nucleus, is predicted to take this form according to quantum theory. What do I do? Let us say I, let us say I suspect, for, because of my understanding of cosmology, that maybe these atoms are out of equilibrium because uh, some exotic effect from gravity or because there's some relic from the very early universe, whatever. Um, how could I test this? All right, let's say I have millions and millions and billions of these atoms, and I pick a random sample, a large random sample, a large random sample of millions, and I measure the electron positions. Just from standard statistical inference, I can deduce the most likely parent distribution. Imagine if, and in principle, according to this theory, this could happen, that you might find that the parent distribution, or the best estimated parent distribution, is significantly different from the quantum prediction. Okay? I've still got all of the other atoms to play with. Remember, I have these billions of atoms. I've taken a random sample of millions. I've deduced from you know, measuring these what the parent distribution is. It turns out it's far from equilibrium. Fantastic. Now we have this resource. I've still got billions. I haven't touched them. I haven't disturbed them. I haven't done anything. They're sitting there, and I know what the distribution is, and I know that it's non-equilibrium. I then can start to do things. One thing I can do, and discuss this here, is I could pick pair, take pairs of these things, entangle them, and send superluminal signals, like the sort of thing that I showed you before, because out of equilibrium, the marginal distribution here generally depends instantaneously on the local Hamiltonian here. Let me talk about something else that you could do. Super quantum tasks. Subquantum measurement. Let us imagine I have a particle, um, particle in a box with a position x. Of course, I don't know where it is, but it has a certain wave function. I want to measure its position. What do I do? I couple it to a pointer. Let's use the standard von Neumann Hamiltonian for a measurement of position. 
Let's assume that the position x of the system over an ensemble, I'm going to assume I have an ensemble, or, you know, I repeat this experiment many times. Let's assume that over the ensemble, x is in equilibrium. The probability distribution for the x's is just the usual Born rule. But let's assume that the pointer is made of non-equilibrium, you know, I somehow I've taken these non-equilibrium hydrogen atoms and I've used them to construct a pointer. I mean, you know, well, well, never mind exactly how we do this. Imagine I have a pointer that has some initial known wave function, and it has a known non-equilibrium distribution. So, for example, the pointer packet, the pointer wave function might be a Gaussian, but the actual distribution of the pointer positions might be a much narrower Gaussian. Simple example. All right, we couple these x and y by this Hamiltonian. This is the Schrodinger equation for the joint wave function. It implies a continuity equation that looks like this. And I would ask you to do a bit of homework here and show, remember, from the continuity equation, you get this current, and the de Broglie velocity is defined to be the current divided by psi squared. That's a general construction for any system with a continuity equation. That implies that in this case, for this simple system, if I assume that I have this Hamiltonian and I ignore the Hamiltonians for the system and the pointer, the de Broglie velocity field looks a bit funny. It's no longer the gradient of the phase. It's just given by x dot is always 0 and y dot equals ax, which implies these simple trajectories. During this interaction, x stays still and the pointer moves by an amount that is proportional to the position uh, of, of, of the system. So it's a bit of homework. For a system with this configuration and with this Hamiltonian, derive these de Broglie bohm velocity fields for x and y. Give you a sense of where, where these equations come from. Um, I'm, I'm always used, I can't help saying it, I always say it when I give lectures in the US, I say, why well, give you your homework problem? Maybe there'll be a problem like this on the exam. Or maybe, maybe there won't. Anyway, just to encourage you to actually uh, do it. All right. Um, so here I was, here I was, here, here we have this system. Um, let's now look at a simple example. All right, let's say that the initial joint wave function looks like this. The particle is a superposition of, the wave function is a superposition of two delta functions. And the particle is either at L or at minus L. And here's the pointer packet. Let's say the pointer packet is some narrow Gaussian. The Schrodinger equation that I just wrote down here for you implies um, uh, whoops, the following um, evolution. Okay, this is just the usual separation. Those are the Schrodinger equation forms branches. In one branch, the pointer points this way. In the other branch, the pointer points the other way, corresponding to the two different values of position, x is L or minus L. In this theory, there's something extra. X and Y, there are actual positions moving in accordance with these equations. Well, actually, X doesn't move and Y moves. Given this velocity field, you can calculate the time evolution of any initial joint distribution. Okay, by construction, if X and Y move according to these velocities, an arbitrary distribution, P, an arbitrary joint distribution, will evolve according to this continuity equation. So if the initial density is equal to psi squared, remember I'm assuming the Born rule for x, but an arbitrary non-equilibrium for y. So this pi zero need not equal the square of the pointer packet. Okay, I've got a general distribution. This has a simple solution that looks like this, and you can check that if you want to do some homework. Let me just show you what it looks like. For an, let's first consider just equilibrium. So in other words, in effect, standard quantum mechanics. Um, here I have my probability density in configuration space at the initial time. Remember, I have two, the point, the x is either at minus L or at plus L, and the pointer has a, the packet for the pointer has a certain width. Um, as this evolves in time, these two branches separate with respect to y. So here in this branch, the pointer moves uh, up. In this branch, the pointer moves down. After a certain time, here delta is the, is the width of the pointer packet in Y space. After a certain time, the two branches separate. And if I look at the pointer and I find it here, I can say with certainty, ah, 
okay, so, um, you know, I deduce what, where the particle was. All right. Now, if instead you have a narrow non-equilibrium pointer, imagine here, this is at the initial time, this is the support of the Born rule. But we're assuming that the actual width of the non-equilibrium distribution is smaller. So imagine the pointer packet is a Gaussian, that's the psi squared is a Gaussian, but the actual density for the pointer is a narrower Gaussian. All right? So here is the, the shaded area is the region where the actual probability density is non-zero. And you see now that after a short time, you have a non-overlap. If I look at the pointer after a short time, I will either find it in here or I find it in here. If I find the pointer in here, I can deduce with certainty the position x. Whereas in standard quantum mechanics, if I find the pointer in here at this time, well, I don't know if I'm in this packet or if I'm in this packet because these two packets still overlap with respect to y space. So in other words, if you think about this in the limit, where I have an extreme non-equilibrium, where the actual point of density is arbitrarily narrow, you find that for arbitrarily short times, I could measure the position of x without, heart, without changing the wave function, at least to arbitrary accuracy. If t goes to zero, the total wave function is hardly changed, and yet if the non-equilibrium distribution of the pointer is sufficiently narrow, I've measured the position of the particle. This is an analog of the classical ideal non-disturbing measurement. In other words, if I had equipment whose quantum noise, or whose, sorry, whose statistical noise is vanishingly small, I could make measurements on ordinary systems to arbitrary accuracy uh, without disturbing the wave function. Um, if you consider, if you imagine repeating this kind of thing many times, you could track the trajectory without disturbing the wave function. If I possessed apparatus in a state of arbitrarily narrow quantum equilibrium, in other words, arbitrarily far uh, from quantum equilibrium. Um, all kinds of miracles that one could do um, is 10 to 6, a few things. Let me whiz through this. If it's possible to track trajectories without disturbing the wave function, some remarkable things happen. Consider two non-orthogonal quantum states. In general, they generate different de Broglie velocity fields. The trajectories associated with these alternative wave functions are generally different. So if I have two non-orthogonal wave functions, um, by measuring the trajectories, I could tell which wave function it was. You, can disting you could distinguish non-orthogonal quantum states. This means that you could eavesdrop on quantum key distribution. Um, you know, without going into details, the, these the standard protocols rely on the impossibility of distinguishing uh, non-orthogonal quantum states without disturbing them. I've got Alice is sending Bob a state. It could be psi zero or psi one. These are non-orthogonal states. And, you know, they, 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 you know, they're sort of random. Sometimes I send you psi zero, sometimes psi one, and we do random measurements. And, they, you know, and there's no need to go into the details of the protocol. The point is the protocol relies on the fact that, well, if you have an eavesdropper who, who wants to see, well, which state did Alice send in each case? <clears throat> you measure the state, you disturb the state. Um, uh, this would be visible. Alice and Bob would realize that the states have been disturbed. Someone's eavesdropping. Here, in principle, if Eve has access to non-equilibrium matter, she could perform the kind of subquantum measurements that I've talked about and distinguish these non-orthogonal states. If the non-equilibrium matter was arbitrarily a small statistical dispersion, this could be done arbitrarily accurately. Um, similarly, the sort of EPR protocol, um, let me maybe rush over this, but basically, those of you those who are familiar with this will know what I'm talking about. I have, a, have an EPR pair. I'm, I'm, I'm making measurements at, at each wing. Um, that, that if I happen to measure along the same axis, they're perfectly anti-correlated. Um, 
Eve with a subquantum measurement could tell exactly where these particles begin in the initial packet and could actually predict what the outcomes are going to be at each wing and so would be able to eavesdrop. Um, let me say very quickly something about subquantum computation. I, I wrote a paper, perhaps slightly rashly, in 2002, suggesting that this could be computationally more powerful than quantum theory. Um, but this ability depends on the size of the dispersion. Um, basically, a well-defined model of computational complexity would require a, 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 that the resources be quantified. And so there's a question here. You know, that we, we need the non-equilibrium to be narrower than the quantum value. How narrow does it have to be de depending on the size of the task? Hasn't been studied yet, so, you know, something's actually not known. You can certainly do new forms of computation, but what the power of it would be uh, is not known. Um, so I have five minutes. Something I'd like to talk about very quickly is um, the difference between, so quick change of subject, total change of subject, we're um, comparing De Broglie 1927, this theory was revived by Bohm in 1952, but in a, with a different form of the dynamics. De Broglie's dynamics that I've emphasized is the law of motion for velocity. Bohm wrote the law of motion like this, he wrote it in a sort of pseudo-Newtonian form, as equation for acceleration with this extra piece called the quantum potential. These are generally regarded as equivalent, and it's a sort of matter of taste, which one you prefer. Actually, it turns out that Bohm's dynamics, um, I've shown you that in De Broglie's dynamics, non-equilibrium, at least under certain assumptions, evolves towards equilibrium. This is not true in Bohm's dynamics. In Bohm's dynamics, non-equilibrium does not relax, and I think this actually means that Bohm's version is actually, is actually wrong. Um, in Bohm's version, you get quantum mechanics. So Bohm, the fundamental law of motion is for acceleration. You get quantum mechanics if you assume the initial Born rule for positions and if you assume that the initial momenta are given by the gradient of the phase. In Bohm's dynamics, this equality here is an initial condition. Okay, in a second order theory, with a, you know, Newton's law of motion. The initial position is arbitrary, the initial momentum is also arbitrary. It turns out that if you assume that the initial momentum happens to equal grad S, and you assume the Born rule, you get quantum mechanics. Notice that in De Broglie's dynamics, this is actually the law of motion. So what does this mean? In De Broglie's dynamics, P is grad S is always true. Whereas in Bohm's dynamics, I can consider what happens if P is not equal to grad S. Um, little point of terminology. There's a, there's a misnomer in the field that people often talk about um, De Broglie's dynamics. They, they, it's often called, well, some people call it Bohmian mechanics. This is, this is a, a misnomer. This is, Bohm, this is Bohm's mechanics or Bohm's dynamics. Um, Bohm's dynamics, um, I'm not going to go into details, but basically you can consider in phase space, the equilibrium distribution in phase space looks like this. The momenta are restricted to a certain surface in phase space. And you might ask what happens if you start out of equilibrium. Do they relax to equilibrium? The answer is they do not. Um, you can look at this paper if you're interested in the details. Um, in, in fact, you find that deviations from equilibrium can grow with time. Um, so if the universe started out in non-equilibrium, in Bohm's dynamics, you would not expect to see equilibrium today. So I think the theory um, is, actually, um, is actually in contradiction with observation. Um, so I would say that the Bohm's reformulation was a mistake and is not a viable candidate for physical theory, Whereas De Broglie's original formula, sorry, De Broglie's original formulation um, remains a viable candidate. Notice as a candidate. Maybe this is all wrong, but still, at least in De Broglie's theory, if I begin out of equilibrium, I can understand how you relax to equilibrium, and which is in in agreement with what we see. Okay, final two minutes. Let me just say something about two. I have two last slides, so.
Don't panic. I mean, actually, miraculously, almost exa exactly on time. I think it's, I think it's false month. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my man, one of my heroes, her heroes, Boltzmann, one of my heroes, fantastic, band. fantastic. Whereas Mark, I'm not not so keen on Mark. But anyway, I keep pressing this thing by accident. Let me just say something about I, I mentioned here this last slide. The Broglie's pilot wave theory remains a viable candidate for physical theory. All right, let me just remind you. I mean, I'm very keen on um, you know experiment and evidence. Um, and as best as I, I've been able to do over the years working on this, well, here are my best hopes for um, uh, evidence for this theory. One is that, well, if quantum relaxation occurred in the very early universe, it would leave signatures on the cosmic microwave background. Um, we'd actually come up now with some details of what the signatures might look like, and there are more details that, we're, 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 that I'm developing, also with, with, with a student in Clemson. Um, these anomalies that have been reported are weak and controversial. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, I think uh, you know, over the next uh, few years, this, this should be clarified, um, comparing our predictions with the data, and of course other people either uh, looking at the data. And Anyway, this is an ongoing project. Another possibility, which is much more, I say, more of, well, I was going to say more of a long shot, but perhaps not. In principle, we could discover relic non-equilibrium particles from the early universe. So one paper I discussed recently in some, went into this in some detail, but as I mentioned earlier, if, if, if particles decoupled sufficiently early and they didn't have time to reach equilibrium, they could still exist in the universe today. And another thing that I'm looking at and sort of adding, you know, going out even perhaps more speculative is that um, some of the peculiarities of the way gravity um, fails to merge with quantum mechanics is perhaps a clue that perhaps gravity can actually create non-equilibrium. Remember I said in standard de Broglie-Bohm theory without gravity, once you're stuck in equilibrium, once you're in this quantum heat death, there's no way out of it. But possibly there are exotic gravitational effects um, that can perhaps knock a system out of equilibrium, something that I'm working on. So, who knows? Time will tell. Perhaps there's nothing in this. Perhaps um, in one of these directions some evidence could emerge. Uh, we will see. Um, I'd like to say one last thing, and my, la my very last slide, is that the legacy of Mark and Boltzmann lives on. Um, and while preparing this talk, it, it occurred to me that the, 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 perhaps the, the best way I could summarize this is, here is a quote from an article I wrote for Physics World. It was published in 2009. It's also on the archive. Um, it's called Beyond the Quantum. And it basically summarizes the kind of thing that I've been presenting here. This is the very last paragraph of the article. And uh, here it is, I'll, I'll read it out to you. So the slow and intermittent development of pilot wave theory, presented in 1927, ignored, forgotten, rediscovered in 1952, reformulated, though, in a way that was, I think, wrong. Many people misunderstood it. There is this odd history of this theory. The slow and intermittent development, people misunderstanding, forgetting, rediscovering this theory. This is reminiscent of the development of the classical kinetic theory of gases, which, as I understand it, goes back to Daniel Bernoulli. Had, had I, had, you know, was, um, some preliminary ideas along these lines as, as early as the 18th century. John Waterston, I don't know how many people here will have heard of John Waterston. John Waterston is an interesting case. I, he was, a, I think, a Scottish engineer, if I remember rightly. He, I believe, in the 1830s, he wrote a paper in which he derived the gas laws from, you know, the relationship between pressure and volume, sorry, the relay Boyle's law, relationship between pressure and volume, using the kinetic theory um, I've not seen his original paper, but apparently he had a simplified derivation where he assumed that, here's a box, he assumed one-third of the particles are moving along X, one-third along Y, one-third along Z. He was able to derive an expression for how the pressure, 
would vary with volume, and he submitted it to the proceedings of the Royal Society, and it was roundly rejected. Apparently, it was discovered by... Hang on, am I getting this... Yes, I think it was discovered by Lord Raleigh in the 1890s, poking around in the archives of the Royal Society, found this paper. And he looked at it and realized, oh my God, here was someone in the 1830s who had the essential idea of kinetic theory of gases. He was too far ahead of his time. He actually had it published in the proceedings. I think by this time, Waterston had died, I think. I think that's right, but perhaps, perhaps uh, I think he had died. Anyway, John Waterston um, was understandably quite bitter about all this. But anyway, um, you know, so there were precursors that were mostly ignored until the ideas were taken up as I understand it, when Rudolf Clausius wrote a famous paper about this in 1857, that is when people really started to take up this idea. It still took decades of further work by Maxwell, Boltzmann, Gibbs, Einstein, to yield the observable prediction of Brownian motion. Finally, in 1905, this long development from Fanuli, Waterston, all these people, you finally had a, a prediction that could be tested. You look at the motion of a pollen grain, and you look at the you look at the um, um, the, the the random walk of it, and it agree the way it depends on temperature and everything. Evidence for the existence of atoms. So. Will history repeat itself? Will there be, um, will any of these uh, possible experimental, um, these possible avenues for experimental evidence be realized? Will perhaps evidence emerge in some other way that I haven't thought of? Will none of this work? Will quantum mechanics always be valid? Will we never find deviations from the Born rule? Time will tell. Um, hopefully, and um, let's hope we live long enough to see it. But there we go. Um, and that's it. So thank you so much. Thank you. How do I... Who was first? Was anyone first? I just, um, would you like to... Please, please go ahead. So, sorry? Sorry? Cosmology part. When this calculation is spanning space, yes. you assume the radiation of the universe. Yes. Right. What was the nature of the Schrodinger field, in a sense? I'm asking because the radiation, of course, is a. Right, okay. Fluid, yeah. So yeah, sorry, so I didn't. Yeah. And the normal yeah. is the Schrodinger equation and maybe yeah. some other thing, maybe right. some axiom like matter or something. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so sorry, because I, I didn't have time to no, go into no, any sure. detail. So, all, all it is. Um, what I'm thinking of in the background is there are some models where before inflation there's an era, you know, called people a pre-inflationary era, um, that possibly, and if um, if that era was dominated by radiation, then the um, then the scale factor, the Einstein equations tell us, will expand as the square root of t. So now what I was actually calculating, I mean, the model I looked at, is we just say, we, we just have expanding space. <clears throat> well, we just assume that the scale factor goes as the square root of t. So that's what I mean, you know, let's say radiation dominate. I just mean that the scale factor goes as the square root of t. And that's the background space-time. On this space-time, all we have in our calculation is a scalar field. It's a free, massless, minimally coupled scalar field, just with the standard Hamiltonian and so on. And when you look at that in uh, Fourier space, and you look at a, you know, a decoupled mode, so I now just have, an, and I, I write the Fourier component of the field as its real and imaginary part. So I have, in effect, a wave function for a system with two degrees of freedom. Mathematically, and this is just standards, or nothing to do with De Broglie Bohm, mathematically that system is exactly the same as a simple harmonic oscillator with a time dependent mass and angular frequency, where the mass, quotes, mass is given by the cube of the scale factor. Um, and you know, and, and, and that, that's the system. And we took the, the initial wave function was a superposition of the first 25 energy states of that, you know, quotes, oscillator. Well, it's not really an oscillator, but, you know, just mathematically. And, and you know, that, 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 so that, that was the model we worked with. And the, the idea, and of course there's so much I didn't have time to talk about, but the idea is 
that look, if before inflation, and you know, I'm certainly not, you know, a number of people are considering you know, what might have happened before inflation, and if you calculate what might have happened before inflation, could that leave a signature on what happens during inflation, which is then imprinted on the micro background, okay? So the idea here is, well, let's imagine that before inflation you had such a period um, where you begin out of equilibrium and it relaxes, but at short wavelengths it relaxes, and at long wavelengths the relaxation is retarded. Okay, the idea is that we will get a prediction for what the probability distribution for this scale of field will be at the beginning of inflation. Now, at the beginning of inflation, there's supposed to be a scale of field called the inflaton. So, in other words, the, the kind of um, deformed Born rule that we're predicting, that at long wavelengths the variance is squeezed with respect to the Born rule, that is our prediction for the spectrum of the inflaton field at the beginning of inflation. I see, but actually the inflaton is modeled using the klein wharton equation, which is the relativistic um, generalization equation. Oh, oh, so uh, oh, our Hamiltonian, oh, okay, oh, oh, so oh, okay. I, want, I would be surprised if you can get okay. away with the non-relativistic I see, I see, okay. okay. So what we're doing... Um, Sorry, well, okay, so I see where the, uh, so, so we're not, we're, what we're doing is completely equivalent. So all we have is, um, imagine that the Lagrangian density is, uh, well, let me, let me just, if, if I had a unit scale factor, okay? Um, now let me write down the Hamiltonian density. The Hamiltonian density. Um, Okay, I, have a, I have a free massless scalar field. Let's just say, man, let's just do it in, just do it in without expanding space, just to keep this simple. So that should be uh, the gradient squared. So I've got the mass is zero. Okay, or the Lagrangian density, which, if I remember rightly, is just this. I might be getting a sign wrong. Anyway, just off the top of my head, the point is that just classically, classically, of course. Okay, you're absolutely right. This implies the klein gordon equation, okay? But that, that's classical. But what we're doing in, in the quantum field theory is we have um, we're working in the functional Schrodinger picture. So what we have, we have a wave functional. So given a field configuration, phi, um, you have um, a functional, is, a, is, a, is a, a function of a function. So given the field configuration, there is an amplitude. And this obeys. So this picture, it's, it's not used, it's sort of standard quantum field theory textbooks don't use it much, but it's used a lot in, in, in quantum cosmology. It's convenient. So we have... Um, the standard Schrodinger equation. So you mean you're using something like the Wiener Delete equation? Um, hang, hang, hang on, just, just a, So what we have is this is the standard Schrodinger equation for a wave functional where h hat, the operator corresponding to this, so this is pi squared, the canonical momentum, the canonical momentum operator is minus the functional derivative with respect to the field. So what we have here is minus this is the Hamiltonian operator that appears on the right hand side. This is minus the second functional derivative with respect to phi. Okay, this is this is completely equivalent to if you this is fully, when I say re relativistic, in the sense it's valid at high energies. I mean, it's defined with respect to, I mean, there's a, often a confusion about what you mean by relativistic, non-relativistic. Um, when you do, sorry, let me just say, what I've written so far is the standard quantum field theoretical functional Schrodinger equation in a given frame, with a given time parameter. Okay, De Broglie bohm adds the following, it says there is an actual field configuration that evolves in time 
according to this equation, where this is the functional gradient of the, the functional gradient of the phase. Okay. Now, in equilibrium, if I have a probability distribution of fields that is given by the modular squared of the wave functional, I just get the same predictions as quantum field theory. And this picture um, is completely equivalent to if I re so if I just said, all right, forget the trajectory. I've just got this functional Schrodinger equation and the Born rule. This is equivalent. If I go to the Heisenberg picture, okay, where psi, the state psi is static, and the operator, the field operator, is now time dependent, this Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian operator, which is the, sorry, I forgot, um, sorry, I've gone and written, um, sorry, the Hamiltonian operator, this is, this is the Hamiltonian density operator, and the Hamiltonian is the integral over space of the Hamiltonian density. All right. So the, um, so in other words, my functional Schrodinger equation, which looks like this, in the Heisenberg picture, I just get, I get the operator Klein-Gordon equation. Okay. So, for the de Broglie-Bohm theory, I have to pick a particular frame and a particular time parameter to write down the theory, because this is non-local. If I have a wave functional that's entangled, the field here is entangled with the field over there, the velocity of the field here will depend on what's going on over there. So I need to pick a particular frame. But in that given frame, the predictions are in, in equilibrium, the predictions are exactly the same as the high energy, quotes, relativistic, quantum field theory of a free scalar field. There's no, there's no, um, that, that's, that's exactly the same. So, so, you know, there's nothing, no approximation, it's not non-relativistic in that way. Is, is that answered? Um, okay. Carl? Yeah, I have, have, have a comment in the, in the question. The question you know, you Sorry, sorry, I can't quite hear. The comment in the question. Okay, good. Uh, the comment is, um, I think we should, we should not be, uh, consider ourselves uh, living in the time we are actually living, but going beyond that, let's say 400 years from now, or 1,000 years from now. And, and I, I think in 500 years from now, as Danny Greenberg has mentioned once, uh, all our theories we currently believe are correct, will, will be ridiculous, and, and will be overthrown by some other theory. Now, in my opinion, it, it would be totally eyesight to believe that the current theories remain, will remain forever. So, so the question isn't if this remains, but how, how these theories will be developed and, and, and which kind of theories will, will, will substitute them. Exactly. Behind it. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, that is a viable standpoint and uh, is a little bit con contrary to what uh, some people believe now to be the fundamental concept that there is randomness which is irreducible in the universe or you know, something. Yeah? Because, yeah. because this theory is a kind of uh, resurrection of introduction of rationality or, or, or determinism. Uh, yeah, causality. Although, if you uh, assume that the initial value is part of the continuum, you know that it's probability one. If you, with the axiom of choice, you need the axiom of choice for that. If you grab 
So you can, you know, if you want, you can, I mean, all of this, for instance, strictly speaking, these functional derivatives is not quite well defined. In the, in the background here, it's assumed that when you write down these equations, there's some sort of regularization. Maybe you've discretized very small scales, there's a high frequency cutoff, you put this in a finite box, I have a discrete, sort of countable, countable number of degrees of freedom, um, which is actually, you know, more, more easy to work with than... Um, so, so I, yeah, so, so this was just, just my comment. And the question I have is, of course now, uh, uh, the modern day of uh, expressing indeterminism would be by the Gleason theorem and uh, the Kosciuszko-Becker theorem, the related theorems like the Lidovsky's theorem of indeterminism. And there they operate in three-dimensional real space and uh, they have fanatistic proofs of uh, the impossibility to associate in a consistent and not what they call non-contextual way certain truth values with certain measurement operators and so on and so forth. So please, could you, could you give us an account of what would you make out of paint inequalities? Yes, good. So, um, thank you. Um, so, one, one slight thing I would query, when you phrase your question, you said, um, you know, proofs that you cannot construct a consistent or non-contextual. You seem to say that the words consistent and non-contextual are somehow equivalent. So, actually, there's nothing wrong with a contextual hidden variable theory. Uh, I, I would say, given non-contextual... Ah, uh, okay, if you, if you were... Okay, 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 sorry, good, okay, good, thank you. So, okay, so non-contextual hidden variables theories disagree with quantum mechanics, just as local hidden variables theories disagree with quantum mechanics. The Broibohm theory uh, is both non-local and contextual. Now, um, the simplest way to illustrate this is actually with the old, you know, imagine I have, um, I have my usual two spins, two spin halves, in, you know, in, in the singlet stage, and I'm looking at EPR or Bell-type correlations. Um, can we know that when we say that the hidden variables theory has to be non-local, what we mean is that if you, do a hidden, if you make a hidden variables theory of this system, the outcome of a spin measurement here must depend on what, along which axis you measure the spin over here. Okay, if I rotate my stern girl act here, it's going to affect the outcome over here non-locally. Okay, that, that's, at least from the point of view of a deterministic hidden variables theory, that's the upshot of Bell's theorem. Now, that is actually a form of contextuality. What is it saying? It's saying, I can measure the spin here, and I can measure the spin here, and I can measure them at the same time. These, these operators commute, okay? And Bell's theorem is telling you that the outcome of this measurement depends on which operator I measure here. Do I measure spin along Z? Do I measure spin along Y? In other words, it's saying that the outcome of this spin measurement is contextual in the sense that it depends on what, what you're measuring over here. Now, um, I've said that because contextuality, I don't know how you know, everyone here is familiar, but is really the same kind of thing. It's really, you could say that non-locality is a form of contextuality acting at a distance. More generally, I can have a single system here with, you know, maybe a four-dimensional Hilbert space, and I can measure different observables, and maybe I can measure A and B simultaneously, or I can measure A and C simultaneously. And contextuality says that the outcome of a measurement of A depends on whether you measure B or C. So it's just a sort of generalization of what we had here. Okay, so now with that background, what happens with the two spins? Um, in de Broglie-Bohm theory, if you are in equilibrium, no, sorry, in de Broglie-Bohm theory, the outcome of a single spin measurement here 
does depend instantaneously on what you do here. Remember, as I said, you change the Hamiltonian here, you shift your stern girl like apparatus, it affects the motion of the system here, it will affect the outcome of a spin measurement, okay? If you're in equilibrium, so it's a non-local theory, so it's consistent with Bell's theorem. If you're in equilibrium, it turns out that the marginal distribution here, when you, you know, you're averaging over an ensemble, in equilibrium, the marginal distribution does not depend on what you do here. Okay, so this thing that I'd already talked about, I did it with the example of the two boxes. Each individual outcome here depends on what you do here. If you average over an equilibrium ensemble, the effect vanishes. The, mark, the statistics here doesn't depend on what you do here. So here you have, um, what I'm telling you there is, look, you have a non-local, you have non-locality, but the non-locality averages to zero in equilibrium. The statistics becomes local here. The same thing happens... Now, okay, so now let's reinterpret this as contextuality. Okay? Um, the same system. The outcome of a spin measurement here depends on what I measure here. In other words, the outcome is contextual. It's a contextual hidden variables theory. If you average over an equilibrium ensemble, the contextuality disappears. The statistics here becomes non-contextual doesn't depend on what you do here. The same thing happens with the general setup. I have a system here. I can measure A and B or A and C. The, uh, the quotient specker theorem tells you, you know, the outcome for A can depend on whether you measure B or C. This will be true in pilot wave theory. When you average over an equilibrium ensemble, the contextuality vanishes. So I would say again, you know, um, people will sort of ask about contextuality, and they're often they're thinking, you know, somehow, let, let's give him some grief. You know, how do you explain, you know, what have you got to say as if Cauchy-Specker theorem is somehow maybe going to put us in trouble? Actually, I would put this all the other way around. I would give a question, I would fire a question back and say, look, I mean, it's a bit like what I was saying about non-locality. Here's, here's my question to you, Carl is let's take the message of the quotient specker theorem that somehow the outcome of a measurement depends on what you're measuring simultaneously. It is contextual. Then there's a question. Why is it that when I look at the statistics of an ensemble, the statistics are not contextual? Okay, simple theorem in quantum mechanics. The marginal distribution for this observable does not depend on which... Thing I observe. So to me, there's a mystery, and it's exactly, it's a generalization of the conspiracy that I was talking about. There is non-locality, but it vanishes when you, you know, at the statistical level. Why? Here, the, the quotient specter theorem tells us there is contextuality, but it vanishes at the statistical level. Why? De Broglie-Bohm theory gives an explanation. It says, well, fundamentally, there's a contextual hidden variables theory. In equilibrium, it so happens these effects average to zero and the statistics are non-contextual. So that was a very long answer, but anyway, I hope, uh, I hope it's been helpful. So. Um, so yes? Uh, so Sorry, I, I actually forgot. <laughs> Forgotten that I'm supposed to be moderate. Normally, I'm sort of waiting for a moderator to say, "Okay, okay." It's so, more convenient. I will do it. I'll try. I'll try to remember. I'll try to remember to to, to I have this problem with uh, stopping. I, I just like this juggernaut. But once I get going, I can't stop. Anyway, um, please. So when you are of equilibrium, uh, you have like a preferred frame of reference. Yes. And what happens now in the transition when you go to an equilibrium? Is this vanishing? Where is the point where you suddenly don't have a preferred frame? Yes, so, so it is. Also, uh, yeah. also, when you go from the signaling to no signaling, is this like a sharp transition? Uh, okay, yes, yeah. so no, so there wouldn't be a sharp transition. It, it would be that, you know, as you approach equilibrium, yeah. the, I mean, you remember I had that, um, that expression for around, uh, an example, uh, you know, of, of the entangled boxes, um, particles in, in, sorry, A and B, and um, there's an expression, if, if I change the Hamiltonian here, 
then there's an expression for, if I then look at the, the marginal distribution um, of A, which is of course just the, um, the integral over xB, let's just take these to be, okay, the, the integral with respect to xB of the joint density, the expression for the change in the marginal, so this non-local effect, that I change the Hamiltonian here, the marginal distribution here changes. Remember, there are various factors that I won't write down, but it depends on um, the difference between the actual density, so this is all integrated, um, yeah, I could go, it may have been easier to just go back through my slides, but anyway, the, the expression for the change in the marginal here depends on an integral over the difference between p and psi squared, okay? So, if you can't see that, I'll lift it up. Um, so, you know, as p approaches psi squared, this goes to zero, but continuously. So, you know, if P differed just, you know, by epsilon from psi squared, there would, you know, there would be a tiny, a very small uh, change in the marginal distribution here. So, so there's a continuity. Similarly, with the, with the Lorentz invariance, in equilibrium, the statistics, you know, if you, do, if you do the quantum field theory and you're in equilibrium, you know, it's very clear in the Heisenberg picture, the, the, the statistics are Lorentz covariant. But again, if you if you know if you are out of equilibrium, that Lorentz invariance will be broken, but it could be by you know a very small amount if, if the amount of non-equilibrium is very small. So, um, so there's no no sudden transition. Uh, this transition um, and this probability minus psi squared does it directly evolve out of Hamilton dynamics? Sorry, it's not it... something you put in. It, 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 it comes out directly of, of the... This, this expression? Yes. Oh, this comes from evolving... Um, so the continuity equation for P yeah. is just... Um, field for each is given by the gradient of the phase of the whole wave function and the time evolution of the joint density is just remember I said that for any system maybe it's easier to just uh, go back here um, whoops so um, you know for any system of any any number of dimensions okay you have this this uh, construction here from the show you define a velocity field given by j over psi squared where j is just the usual Schrodinger current. If you assume I have now an ensemble where, um, where each particle in each, each configuration in the ensemble follows that velocity field then by construction an arbitrary density evolves like according to this. So here you're talking about you have a six you have a you have a six-dimensional configuration space. So that continuity equation, um, if you ask what does it look like if I have two particles in three-dimensional space, so this is what it looks like. So beginning with an initial p that is different, so sorry, I should have put the, this is a, the initial time because this was calculated for small t. So it depends on the integral and uh, the, the factor that appears is the difference between the distribution and psi squared at the initial time that appears under the integral sign. Um, this quantity here was calculated from, we have to calculate the time evolution of the joint distribution and then take the marginal. The time evolution of the joint distribution is obtained from this equation. 
Basically, what I did in that paper is I studied this equation over a short time, and you could show analytically um, that this one happened. So anyway, the time evolution of the joint density is, is determined by the continuity equation. That's, um, which, and of course, the, the continuity equation, it just states that each particle in the system here, I equals A or B, each particle is following the de Broglie velocity. I mean, that's all. That's what he says. Okay, so it, so it comes from the de Broglie equation of motion. So the fact that when I change the Hamiltonian here, this marginal distribution changes like that, where does it come from? Ultimately, it comes from the de Broglie equation of motion for the motion of the particle. So, uh, yes. yes. Uh, what happens um, with the uh, Heisenberg and Sigma circular relation in de Broglie moment, and in particular out of the equilibrium? Okay, good. Fantastic. Um, I'm running out of black holes. Okay, so. Um, um, all right. So, the way. Oh, whoops. Hang on. Maybe one of the ideas. Let me. Okay, let me use this and just rub out. Um, so. Um, Okay, let, let, let's just first, so basically the, the Heisenberg uncertainty is um, you have a st statistical dispersion what it says is if I measure, if I prepare a certain state and I measure the position I can get a range of values. If instead I measure the momentum, I can get a range of values. Okay? And the product of this ra these ranges satisfies this lower bound. That's the uncertainty principle. Now, what happens in De Broglie Bohm theory? Let us say I have, um, let's say I have an initial wave function confined to some region. Um, and let us say that we have an ensemble of systems in extreme non-equilibrium, so extreme that the, initial, that the particles all begin at the same point. Okay, imagine this you know, extreme non-equilibrium. We have an ensemble of particles with the same wave function, but every particle begins at, is at this point. If I measure, if I measure x, um, I will get the value x0, okay, the delta x, so the, the spread in values of x is 0. So already this is violated. If I measure uh, p, so there's a slight complication here. If I couple it to a pointer, maybe the pointer has a sort of quantum noise in it, but let's imagine the pointer as well has um, this extreme non-equilibrium. There's a definite value for the point of position. Um, or alternatively, let's do the following. Let's say my particle is trapped. Let's say this initial wave function is a harmonic oscillator, ground state. And let's say that to measure the momentum, I switch off the potential. And I let, so that means this wave function will spread. And let's measure the position of the particle at a certain time t. And we will define the momentum to be the mass times the position over t. Let's say this is very small, so it doesn't really matter where it started in here. Um, the point I wanted to make here is that if there's no um, spread in the distribution of the initial configurations, the measurement of p will be determined. If this particle starts at a definite point, as the wave function spreads, it will finish at a definite point. And if over an ensemble, every particle starts at the same point, they will end at the same point, and will get the same value for the measured momentum. So again, delta p is 0. Okay. So if I have extreme dispersion-free uh, non-equilibrium, there's no uncertainty. Everything's determined. What happens if instead 
there is a spread. Imagine there is some, um, now over an ensemble, the initial position varies over the ensemble. The final position here will vary over the ensemble, and this will have a variance. And it's straightforward to show, just for, you know, from the standard, um, if, if you go through this, that if um, the distribution of initial positions is equal to the Born rule, then the probability distribution for the outcomes for the momenta is just the usual quantum value. And so you will recover this thing. If I then you know, calculate the spread in, this has a certain spread, probability distribution in X has a certain spread, the, moment, the outcomes for the momentum measurements will have a certain spread. If you calculate those in equilibrium, you get exactly just the same thing. So, um, you know, so the uncertainty principle, ultimately, you know, it's a statement about statistical dispersion. In this theory, the source of that statistical dispersion is the, the, um, is the distribution over the initial conditions. If there was no spread in the initial conditions, there would be no dispersion, and there would be no uncertainty principle. So... Again, sorry, a long answer, but there's so many things. In fact, I, I remember distinctly at one point starting to write, and I must do at least a couple of slides about the uncertainty principle. And then, you know, I thought, um, anyway, one of the many things I omitted to talk about. But anyway, there it is. So, so please. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a stupid question, but you said please. Um, you can reduce like every measurement to a measurement of a position. Yes. But when I want to measure momentum, don't have some notion of time? Like ah, okay, yeah, well, good, yes, sorry. I, I, I am assuming that in the background there is a time, we have a time parameter. Yes, good, good. no, that's a, that's a fair, good, sorry. I, I mean, I'm sort of implicitly, um, yes, there's a, there's a background time parameter. Good point, no, good point, clearly, yes. So we're running out of time, perhaps we can... Uh, put that question afterwards here in the, uh, in the private area. Um, thank you for coming to the today's lecture series. Uh, we would like to thank the speaker again for the great talk and the discussion. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.